Games Workshop Rising Storm Part 2 The Fracture of Bealtan An Age of Dooms to Come Inexorable, unstoppable, the time of ending tightens its stranglehold upon the twilight years of the 41st millennium. Amongst those caught in its grip are the Eldar, a race of psychically gifted aliens that once ruled the stars. Brought low by their own pride and blind hedonism, now they skirt the precipice of oblivion. Only through the most desperate ploys can they hope to survive. Though the Eldar long ago learned how to stave off the awful, soul-sucking attention of she who thirsts, known as Slanesh in the tongues of men, they have now fully escaped the curse of the deity their hubris spawned. The Eldar of the craft world seek to avoid disaster through ascetism and self-control, using spirit stones and infinity circuits as a refuge from Slanesh, whereas the dark Eldar Cormorites, still given to the excesses that brought their race low, inflict suffering upon others in order to escape their own fate. The enigmatic Harlequins, having pledged their souls to the trickster god Segera, slip through Sinesh's clawed grasp by always staying one step ahead. The Exodites, those Puritans first to free the ancient Eldar worlds, turned their backs on change, instead seeking harmony with the world spirits of their verdant paradises. No matter the methods they use to escape the notice of the god that hunts them all, all Eldar sacrifice much in the process. None can claim to be the equal of their ancient forebears, the Eldari, they who married physical excellence with prodigious psychic ability, safe in the knowledge that upon their deaths they would rejoin the endless cycle and be reborn. There are those amongst the Eldar that seek a way back to those halcyon days. Their peers consider them dangerously deluded. To return to the glowing, incandescent existence of Eon's past is to attract Serenish's gaze, and hence court the worst kind of disaster. Some Eldar refuse to abandon the glorious dream of building the ancient empire anew, or at least burning bright before the end. First amongst these ambitious few is Eldred Ulthran, the high farseer of Craft Ulthway. This arch-manipulator has been plucking at the strings of fate since before the dawn of the Imperium of Man. His prescience is like a diamond blade, sharpened by the intensity of his conviction. By weaving the tangled skeins of destiny, the farseer guides his people to the most favorable of futures. Eldred has long perceived a nascent presence in the infinity circuits of the craft worlds, a distant heartbeat that pulses slow and steady behind a thrum of lost energies. It is comprised not of one life sign, but hundreds of billions, the sum total of every dead Eldar soul across the galaxy. Though individually, these echoes are near insignificant, together they form something so strong that if it were brought to wakefulness, it could prove potent enough to overcome the Eldar curse entirely. This is Inyad, the slumbering god of the dead. The prophecies of the fabled seer, Kaisaduras, tell that when every Eldar has passed from mortal existence, Inyad will rise up and defeat Steinesh forevermore. It was Eldred Ulthran who put into motion a plan to bring forth Inyad, a ploy of such conceited ambition it could buckle the fabric of space and time. Enlisting the aid of the Harlequin Mask of the Midnight Sorrow, he stole away the fossilized crystal statues of long-dead Farseers from their craft worlds and gathered them upon Cohiria, a moon covered in sands of psychoactive crystal. With his crystal council acting as a hyperspatial link to each craft world, Eldred channeled the spirits of the Infinity Circuits onto Cohiria. This was to produce a flare of psychic activity bright enough to wake even Inyad, 
but the intervention of the Xenos hunting Death Watch shattered Eldred's plans at the last. Though Inead stirred in his slumber, he did not fully awaken, not yet, at least. Chapter One The Fracture For the ancient Eldari, life was a cycle of birth, the fulfillment of desire, and a comfortable death, safe in the knowledge that their soul would live again. The birth of their nemesis, the dark god Slanesh, shattered that cycle forever. Now these once great starfarers cower in the shadows, too afraid of their own lusts to embrace the full spectrum of sensation. It is a fate they justly deserve. In truth, there can be no escape from the doom they have brought upon themselves, not this side of the grave. Fate is a cruel mistress, and not to be courted lightly. Araman, Arch Sorcerer of the Thousand Suns Blades of Cormora Screams filled the air, some of agony, some of ecstasy. Within the confines of the Crucibal Arena, the Dark City's elite had gathered in great number to witness the finest spectacle that the Cult of Strife could muster. The Cormorite attendees of the mile-wide arena had paid handsomely for the privilege of being allowed through its statue-framed portals. Some had ceded large portions of their territory to secure their seats, others had handed over thousands of slaves. Still more had performed lethal errands on behalf of the arena's owners, or committed even darker atrocities, to secure a few hours of precious attendance. It was worth every sacrifice, for they were there not merely to be entertained, but to feast. The Dark Elder take their sustenance from suffering, their souls long ago condemned by the coming of she who thirsts, are constantly drained away, ever so slowly, but appreciably nonetheless. Only by witnessing the pain of others can they stave off the aching void that claims their spirits, and the older a Dark Elder soul becomes, the more grievous the atrocities needed to sustain it. Because of this unique blend of sadism and parasitism, the arenas in Cormorah's heartlands combine the role of twisted circus and gluttonous feast. The spectacles mounted there are increasingly outlandish. A seemingly endless supply of enslaved warriors and champions of the lesser races are hacked to pieces each night for the edification of the thirsting crowd. In the most prestigious arenas, the death toll rises ever higher as the witch cults strive to outdo each other in skill and imagination. Through some loathsome displays, the wealthiest Cormorites are reinvigorated, for a time at least. The greatest of all Cormorites arenas is the Crucibal, dominion of the witch cult of strife and sovereign territory of Her Excellence, Lelis Hesperax. This site has played host to countless legendary figures, even being treated to the consummate blade work of the Phoenix Lord, Jaina Zar, first of the Howling Banshees. With a capacity of well over a million, the nightly spectacles staged there are stunning in their magnitude and lucrative beyond measure. No small amount of this tithe is given unto Lerith herself, for the Queen of Knives has ruled here for longer than even the longest lived of her succubi rivals remember. She feeds on countless souls every night and would do anything to preserve her beauty. Since the Cot of Strife's real space raid upon the world of Valador, the Crucible has cultivated some very highly prized battle fodder indeed. Once known as Duriel, the plant of Valador had been corrupted by the infestations of Imperial culture. It was driven to the brink of disaster by not one, but two Tyranid High fleets, and finally tipped into oblivion by an alliance of craftworlders and Dark Eldar, using the doomsday device known as the Fireheart. Before Valador met its fiery end, the witch cult of strife captured the whole swarms of Tyranids, later interbreeding them to enliven their arenas. It was that ravenous brood that Lelith Hesperax unleashed from her stasis prisons 
on what became known as the Night of Revelations. Even though the Tyranids were famous for being deadly in the extreme, utterly alien, and all but impervious to pain, they were not the only attraction that had drawn so large a crowd that night. There was one amongst the succubi who had risen from the gutter to high favour under the patronage of the aristocratic Lady Malus. So far had this gladiatrix's fame spread that even a troop of harlequins had come to see her and her blood brides fight. Some had touted her as fit to challenge Lilith Hesperax in personal combat. This claim was usually a death sentence for even the most skilled warrior, for Lady Hesperax was so immensely gifted in the art of combat that those who faced her usually died in seconds. Yet there was something special about this fashionable new challenger. Known in Cormora as the Daughter of Shades, as Amharak to the Corsairs that once called her mistress, and as Ivrain to the craft worlders that once called her kin. This tall and regal succubus was a favourite in certain wealthy circles. She was not a true Cormorite, and hence was interestingly controversial, famed for her lightning transformations from stately elegance to a whirlwind of violence. When roused to anger, she would shuck off her courtly regalia to slash open the throats of those who had earned her ire. This gory retribution had happened upon the bridge of the Corsair flagship, the Nathriel, within the trophy galleries of the Archon Abrahak, and even on the Seer's bridge of Bialtan. Ivrain's mercurial temperament had endeared her to those who respected decisive violence, in essence, the vast majority of the Dark City's inhabitants. The night Ivrain met Lelith in single combat, the Crucible had already bared witness to several violent displays. An elite band of Slith, the serpentine mercenaries popular in the courts of the Dark Eldar society, had shot, gouged, and poisoned their way through a troop of Denorian clawed fiends amongst a constant barrage of whirling grav blades. Only the gnarled patrician Sasarasen had survived the process. Three covens of homunculi had then showcased their latest creations, sending their blank-faced horrors against the most agile gladiatrixes in classic pairings of beauty versus beast. Next, a battered combat squad of space marines and full power armor had been released from their vex prisons to fight amongst the carnage. Though the Adeptus Astartes had been given only knives with which to fight, they survived a full three minutes killing thirteen witches before the glaives of swooping hellions cut them apart. By the evening's climactic finale, the arena was filled with the baying of a crowd that had started the evening feigning nonchalance. The Tyranids had been released, an alchemical blend of specimens from Hive Fleet's Kraken and Leviathan, cloned at great cost in the laboratories of the homunculi. They darted from hidden tunnels to rampage across the bloody sands, the largest of their number, a blade-limbed hive tyrant, came straight for Ivrain, with its guard beasts at his flank. She cast her gossamer skirts aside to reveal a, a skin-tight witch suit as her blood-bride acolytes fanned out around her. Darting in, Ivrain killed three of the creature's hulking escort in as many seconds. Her husk blade whipped in and out, driven with a fencer's precision under the exoskeletons of the creatures to turn them into explosions of scattering ash. The hive tyrant stormed in, bladed cranium lowered, and scything limbs stabbing. Evrain bowed, as if to a respected opponent before leaping, planting a foot upon one of the creature's sickle limbs and springing over its head in a somersault. She landed beyond it, flicking up a fallen witch's blade with her foot and hook-kicking it into the brain-like sack that protruded over the nape of the tyranid's neck. The creature shrieked an alien war cry, spinning with a speed that belied its immense size before storming forward once more. Ivrain ran to meet its charge, sliding underneath the beast at the last moment and stabbing her house blade up into its midsection. The desiccating curse of the blade went to work, and the hive tyrant crumpled away from the groin upwards. Reduced to scattering beige dust, it blew in the wind to land with titillating foulness 
upon the tongues of the spectators. The roar of approval was so loud it brought the attention of a new foe. Slashing, maiming and decapitating came Lady Hesperax, the Doyan of the arenas. She danced through the carnage towards Ivrain, a deadly nonchalance in every fresh kill. The crowd sat bolt upright in their seats, some craning forward, others standing with expressions of rapt glee. Ivrain was preoccupied, dueling with a whip-fast glitter that had crept from a mound of mangled bodies. She was unable to disengage without risking entanglement in the creature's lashing hooks. Lelis pirouetted between the two combatants, cutting the front half of the lictor's distended face from its head in a spray of squirting tentacles, even as she thrust a blow towards her would-be rival's heart. Irene parried the blow, but only just. She stepped back as she did so, putting some space between her and the whirling dervish that even now took the tear in its head with a series of sashing blows. Lelis turned to Irvain and sashayed forward, a contemptuous smile on her lips as she idly flipped a dagger high. Irvain waved her blood bride's back, springing forward before Lelis could catch the blade. She headed right into a riposte and barely turned it aside. Back and forth the darting combatants weaved, their blades moving with a precision and economy of effort that was enrapturing for the Dark Elder. Even the harlequins in the audience stood agog at the sight. Leith fought with a cold and efficient detachment. She was the more skilled of the two, and both the duelists knew it. Conversely, Ivraine was fired by a focused fury. Her anger gave her blows surety and strength. On went the fight, faster and faster. A blur of thrusts and parries, flips and feints, pushes, dodges and kicks. Now and then, an artful slap or jab into a nerve cluster showed that Lelith was playing with her opponent. Many felt their hearts sink as the close match they had hoped for was revealed as a sham. And then Ivraine's knife slashed across Lelith's forearm. The crowd screamed in approval, but as with much of Dark Eldar society, this too was duplicity. Lady Hesperax had purposefully left an opening and allowed her adversary's blade to land in order to draw the audience further in. Lelith was in no hurry to end the duel, for it would not do to disappoint her patron, as Drubal vect. The supreme overlord was watching from his pyramidal fortress floating high above, gracing the arena with a portion of his attention. The death shriek of a tyrannid giant echoed around the gladiatorial field. Reading her opponent's next blow, Lelith spared a proprietary glance to the wider battle. In a flash, Ivraine reversed her thrust and landed a hard punch right in her adversary's stomach. Lelith took two involuntary steps back, her eyes wide and her superior smile souring into a grimace of anger. The duel stepped up in speed and intensity once more, the chime of dagger upon husk blade and blade fan upon knife ringing loud. Evraine soon found herself wrong-footed and Lelith stamped hard on her instep, the humiliation of the strike bringing her anger to the boil. Lady Hesperax gave ground as Evraine rained blows upon her, slowly drawing her adversary towards a pile of twitching tyrannid corpses. Nimble as a cat, Lelith danced from corpse to corpse to gain the high ground. Irvain climbed the corpse pile, her anger burning away all caution. Then the fallen lictor she had dueled earlier spasmed, throwing her off balance. Lelith leapt and punched a dagger through her foe's sternum. Judging the irony of Irvain's undoing a pleasing end to the dance, Lelith vaulted away in search of fresh prey. Irvain stumbled, but did not fall, hiding the deep wound in her chest with her open blade fan. To show weakness would be to die. It was her blood that betrayed her. Though she fought on, hacking a path through a stampede of hormagons and leaving clouds of flesh dust in her wake, a slick of gore soon painted her abdomen and thighs. The sight of the blood and the occasional falter in Irvain's guard drew a mob of opportunistic hellions from above. The gladiatrix had no intention of falling to such low-life scum. 
She picked up a fallen splinter pistol and sent three of the Hellions to an agonizing death in as many seconds, driving the rest off in a chorus of shrieks. But the youthful predators were not the only enemies drawn by Yvrain's spilt lifeblood. Stalking towards Yvrain came a stick-thin, elegant warrior with long needles in her hands. Her cadaverous body was bound up in a complex net of black silks, the icon of the long-dead crone goddess, Mora Heg, emblazed on her forehead. With a jolt of shock and contempt, Yvrain realized she had seen that ceremonial garb before, in the statue gardens of her native, Beotarn. Her new challenger wore the raiment of an ancient priestess from before the Eldar Empire had fallen. The needles of the crone priestess darted out, and for a few seconds, Yvrain was forced onto the defensive. It was as if she were being assailed by the rapiers of two master fencers at once. Small wonder this warrior had earned a place in the arena. On any other night, Yvrain could have outclassed the priestess without breaking a sweat. But she was sorely wounded. Dismay took hold within her as she felt her strength draining away, her every blow weaker than the last. One of the twin needles pierced Yvrain at the wrist, forcing her to drop her blade fan. She stepped in and viciously backhanded the priestess, intending to force her back. It was like striking marble. Her foe's other razored needle whipped in, slicing through Yvrain's other wrist entirely, and sending her severed hand, still clutching her husk blade, tumbling into the sands. In desperation, Yvrain lunged, open-mouthed and bit deep into the priestess's face. Howls of derision and delight mingled in the arena as Yvrain struggled in close, teeth still in her enemy's flesh. She wrapped her arms around the swordswoman's neck in a choking grip and desperately struggled to suffocate her. Summoning the last of her strength, Yvrain squeezed. Her legs were numb, her wrists masses of hot pain, but as ever, anger and fear gave her strength. The priestess shook and spasmed, but could not break free, her struggles ebbing as her breath abandoned her. Yvrain was on the cusp too. She saw spots of black dance across her eyes, which then grew to obscure her vision entirely. Locked in a mutual death grip, the two combatants shuddered, sighed, and passed the threshold of mortality. Then, as bright as a captive sun, a tiny star burst upwards from the sands of the arena and consumed them both. Yvrain's eyes flew open, milky white and glowing. She screamed as she felt a new dimension of awareness blossom in her pain-addled mind, obliterating the petty concerns of her previous life. Something vast had risen from below, after the crone warrior's death, pressing into Yvrain's soul with the force of a tidal wave. It would not be denied. In her mind's eye, Yvrain saw Inyad. He was a shooting star from a crystal moon, then a shimmering constellation, a trillion points of light that glowed in the outline of a solemn face. The god of the dead's immense eyes fell upon her, and even though the slitted orbs were all but closed, the thin sliver of awareness that he focused upon her was excruciating. His merest scrutiny bared her soul, and in that moment she was claimed utterly and forever as his own. This was a legend made real, the most remote of possibilities wrought in starlight. The apparition was so bright that it seared itself into Evrain's consciousness forever, making her blind to anything other than his glory. Then the godly star Mirage breathed a single word, a whisper yet deafening in its intensity. Daughter. Bow waves of mystic energy exploded outward from Evrain's body as she was raised up by an invisible hand. Off-white, they crackled like an electromagnetic pulse across the arena's western quadrant, and into the stands of the aghast spectators. Wherever they touched Eldar flesh, the energies took hold of the unfortunate individuals and withered them away, turning the audience into nothing more than a horde of blood-slicked skeletons. The largest tyranids, slowed but not slain, stormed into the crowd in a series of bloody rampages. 
Two-born marksmen opened fire with dark lances and splinter cannons as the violence escalated. Some took shots at the calamitous succubus that had laid low their masters, but every beam and projectile was deflected from Evraine's cruciform body. She rose higher, aglow with an aura of unearthly power. Her wounds, alight with white fire, healed over. Even her left hand, severed at the wrist, was restored, formed from blinding energy that coalesced into a stylized gauntlet of ancient design. Lelis Hesperax, leaping with mantis swiftness to catch hold of a swerving Reaver jet bike, veered away high into the night. Her smile was the glint of pearls in the gloom. The Bane of Komora High above the carnage, Azrubal Vec's gigantic viewing pyramid rose on a thrumming cushion of sound. The bass note of its grav engines squirmed in the guts of all present as it headed towards the heart of the Corsbur district. The tyrant of Cormorah had ruled over his impossible domain for so long without developing a keen instinct for when to be elsewhere and did not intend to linger. Instead, he sent his proxies to restore order. Sleek knife craft peeled away from the titanic fuselage of Vect's pyramid, veering silently towards Arena's heart. Some sixth sense woke Evraine from a deathly apotheosis. The ground quaked beneath her feet as she gathered her wits. Though she did not realize it, the metaphysical explosion centered around her had a far graver effect on the dark city than merely destroying parts of the Crucible. Her surviving blood brides ran to join her as the crackling white energies of her transformation had dispersed. Nearby, armed warriors vaulted over the arena's bladed walls. They were headed directly for the reborn succubus, guns and voices raised as they took their chance to pounce. Instinct took over. Quick as a snake, Evraine leaned out of the path of a volley of poison-tipped needles and cartwheeled one-handed over searing Darklan's beam. She vaulted into the shadow of a lumbering Tyrannifex, sending swarms of flesh-eating beetle creatures into the crowd. The immense creature's iron-hard bulk provided a better defensive position than any of the arena's elegantly appointed balustrades. Eyes darting, she forced her thoughts into focus and braved the guards past the beast at her attackers. It did not look good. Her assailants were Kabbalite Trueborn by their insignia, and they had whole shrines of incubi with them. Those crave-wielding artisans of murder preferred not to fight in the arena, seeing it as a distasteful display that could only expose their strengths or weaknesses in the long term. Tonight, they were evidently prepared to make an exception. Irene was slowly becoming aware of the extreme danger she was in, not only had she effectively slain hundreds of the Dark City's finest, she had become possessed by an eldritch force, and judging by the shuddering sands beneath her feet, shaken the entire district to its foundations. The incubi would be the least of her worries when the homunculi moved in. No doubt they planned to dissect her in agonizing, drawn-out detail. If Rain's blood brides ran in zigzagging, bounding packs towards the oncoming incubi, meeting the mercenaries' two-handed claves with shardnets, razor frails, and impalers. Blood flew in graceful arcs as a hurricane of blades erupted. For a while, neither side seemed to be able to gain the upper hand. The sculpted, dense, metallo fibers of the incubi's armor protected them from the slashing blades of all but the nimblest Hecatarii. And the incubi landed few blows in return, for the blood brides moved with preternatural speed. Then each shrine's Clavex leader triggered his bloodstone. Waves of pain racked the blood brides, sending them staggering backwards. The incubi were close enough to capitalize, their movement so smooth it was obvious that they had practiced this maneuver a thousand times. A score of blood brides died in just a few seconds. With the two born moving in to take their choice of kills, the stalemate became a slaughter. Evraine felt an intense pressure build up in her head, every fresh death intensifying the feeling. The incredible sensation swelling in her soul threatened to blind her, deafen her, or stun her into a coma. There was so much death, so many souls cut from their bodies, 
that she could not bear it. The ground itself swelled with power. Evraine spat out six words that arrived unbidden to her lips. The light of the arena, almost painfully bright so the spectators could see every nuance of the fights, dimmed to low twilight. The bright design of the witch's ritual outfits were leached of all color. Even the splashes of blood that seemed to arc in slow motion through the air were rendered near black by the sudden illusion of monochrome. Evraine felt a great gale of pent-up energy escape her, a palpable force that left her feeling as clear-minded and eager as a youth at a rite of passage. The gladiatrix vaulted from the cover of the Tyranifex corpse, snatching up her husk blade from its resting place on the sands. The sword, like Evraine herself, had been transformed. The elegant blade resonated at her touch, and as she held it aloft in her newly gauntleted hand, it was radiant with power. She whipped her head around to find the best route out, and saw a scene from a disturbing dream. The corpses of several dozen dark Eldar fanned out from her position, many of her blood brides lying amongst scatterings of incubi and trueborn that had fallen dead without a single obvious wound. Irene felt her throat tighten at the sight, her eyes hurting with the intensity of the stark spectacle around her. The fairings and balustrades of the arena were still embattled, not so tearing its hacking and slicing their way into the city beyond. Evraine shouted a quick order to her surviving blood brides and ran towards the thinnest area of the crowd, husk blade glowing in her left hand as she retrieved her blade fan with her right. Slashing, jumping, and darting left and right, Evraine and the two dozen blood brides still by her side broke as fast as they could from the edge of the arena. A wall of cabalites barred her path, but as a great shout of anger forced itself from her lips, many of them were ripped from their feet as if by invisible ghosts. It was too much for their comrades. The morbid display had seemed too close to the psychic arts, strictly forbidden in Cormorar, due to the likelihood of drawing the gaze of Slanesh and hence dooming the entire city to a catastrophic disjunction. Few amongst them realized the dire event was already unfolding, a full-blown demonic invasion erupting beneath their feet. As Evraine ran, a hellion in the gang colors of the Gyrbats swooped in, desperate to make a name for himself by capturing or killing the focal point of the carnage. Stepping under the youth's outstretched grave, Evraine flicked out her husk blade and impaled him with its tip. The young warrior fell from his skyboard, which came to a smooth halt as its rider fell apart, not into arid dust, as was usual for Husblade's touch, but into a, a cascade of tiny, glowing embers. Somehow, Evraine heard the howl of the hellion's soul as it departed its body. Although it dwindled, the scream did not recede altogether. The soul had not been drained, nor stolen away by the sucking pull of she who thirsts, as with all other dark elder. In an unlikely moment of contrition, Evraine felt empathy with that dying soul. A heartbeat later, a new voice was in her head, mewling with fear. Distracted as she was, only the sound of armoured footsteps on the sand saved Evraine from a swift decapitation. She leaned back an incubus's grave, whistling less than a finger's breadth from her nose as another of the weapons came in low. With her own blade, she turned the second glaive aside and upwards, ensuring it crashed into the first hard enough to buy her some space. She leveled a solid kick to the midriff of one of the assailants, and a hard elbow to the other, giving her time to recover. Irvine snarled as she saw that six more incubi were circling around her, and that her blood brides were similarly beset. The mercenary killer stepped in close, blades raised in ritualistic battle stances. They would attack as one, a pack of predators rather than a loose gathering of competitors, like the witch cults. Against such disciplined strength, even a succubus would find her life expectancy measured in seconds. If Rain raised her aberrant new husk blade into a guard's stance, and curled a finger to beckon them to their deaths, or perhaps to hers. She saw a flash of crimson armor behind the incubi, and two of their number were suddenly headless. 
Horned helms bounced away as another was halved at the waist. With a flash of inspiration, Ivrain jumped sidelong and grabbed the Garbat's hovering skyboard, legs swinging out wide to kick the fourth incubus in the head, with neck-breaking force. She swung onto the delicate machine as if born to it, though she had never so much as touched a skyboard. She was suddenly familiar with every nuance. Triggering its splinter pod, she shot down a fifth incubus, just as the sixth was cut in half from neck to groin by the crimson fighter. The last two shrine warriors backed away and ran. Disquieted and angry, Ivrain leapt from the skyboard and pointed her blade towards a newcomer as his own fighters rallied to him. He was armed and armoured in the style of Bel Hanshok, a genius artisan whose style Ivrain recognised from sculptures and paintings of the Eldar's long-lost past. More than that, his guard stance was familiar. She had witnessed several of his looping blows in the fight, the very same moves she had used to great effect since her days as an aspect warrior. This mysterious swordsman was clearly not her enemy. With their new allies close, Ivrain and her blood brides emerged triumphant from the melee at Arena's heart. Like a flowing river, the clique of warriors moved fluidly to the nearest egress portal. They avoided the skirmishes between Tyranids and Dark Eldar, and instead sought the streets of the Dark City proper. Ivrain headed for Sekmegra, for that district was a teeming sub-metropolis famous for a dizzying variety of near-do-wells, Cell swords of far lower repute than Incubi. There she would find many of her old allies, from corsair princes to disfigured witches and other outcasts. Should she stay one step ahead of her pursuers, as the dark city reeled from the night's events, she would in theory be able to reach the docks, and with luck enlist the corsairs of her former capital ship, Lanasriel, to her cause. Ivrain's possession by the macabre god Inyad had shaken the very fabric of the Dark City. Far away, a miscarried ritual conducted by Eldred Ulthran on the crystal moon of Kuhiria had twisted Ivrain's fate. Chosen by forces unknown, she had died at the exact moment of the god's ascension. This confluence of Empyrean energy and real space flesh was so severe it led to a hyperspatial quake known in Kormara as a disjunction. Dozens of spires toppled, and districts turned in on themselves, skyscraping statues and high towers shivering and fell apart. Millions died, but there were worse fates in store for those who still braved the streets. Beneath Kormara, there is a sealed portal known as Cain's Gate. This has existed for time immemorial, bound by arcane means against the demon hosts on the other side. Desperate to break in, these hungry fiends have ever grown louder and more insistent, so much so that Vect himself had recently ceded his once-prized territory to his rivals. As the disjunction shook the dark city, the vaulted chambers around Cain's Gate collapsed, killing the caged psychic gnarls that protected it from warp breach. The gate glowed white-hot and then, with a crackling boom, burst open. Thousands of demons poured through, cackling with cruel glee as they sank blades, claws, and fangs into any unfortunate enough to cross their path. Thousands of demons poured through, cackling with cruel glee as they sank blades, claws, and fangs into any unfortunate enough to cross their paths. Urgent spates of conflict flowed into one another as cabals, witch cults, and even the covens of the homunculi found themselves attacked by demons of every conceivable kind. Vect and his cabal had already made haste for safe havens, long prepared in the shadowy recesses of the webway. Cormorar was truly vast. It would survive even this. Knowing the demons would bring disaster, he had left his rivals to suffer the brunt of the invasion. Once they had expended every resource in their struggle against a demon invasion, Vect would return to the Dark City and bring it to heel once more. Ivrain's fight to Sekmegra saw her fight through acquisitive racks, half-real chimera, 
and even a blood-spattered cavalcade of demonettes. But eventually, she reached the spine dock that held her ally's ship. The blade-wielding Visark and his mercenary escort had intervened a dozen times on Evrain's behalf, and each time the intervention had tipped the balance in the Gladiatrix's favor. She had no time to share more than a few words of thanks with the warrior, for now she was content that they both fought on the same side. Though she did not fully comprehend it, Evrain's fate was the fulcrum upon which the fate of trillions had turned. She had been resurrected in a form far stranger and more powerful than even that of the homunculi who sought her. The Daughter of Shades had been reborn. Her journey to a demigodhood hastened by a profound bond forged with Inyad upon the threshold of death. In the process, she had all but doomed the city of Komora to demonic invasion. The Dance of Destiny With Komora erupting into Bedlam, Irene joined forces with the Corsairs that had once been hers to command. Their ship did not escape the spined ports unchallenged, however. None escaped the Supreme Overlord without paying a high cost. As the Lananthriel's sails caught the solar winds of Cormorar's stolen sons, a flotilla of Vex shard craft peeled away from the Corspur dock spars. They came alongside Evrain's ship as the Corsair fleet of those captains she had sought in Sekmegra shimmered on the false horizon. They were tantalizingly close, but not close enough to intervene. A communique was sent, ordering the Corsairs to turn Evrain over to the Cabal of the Black Heart. The choice was stark. Either try to escape and be shot to pieces in the skies above, or hand Evrain over and risk a return to the chaos below. The Corsairs sought another path. It appeared to their progress that they were heading for the arterial webway portal yawning wide over Komara, but that route was soon barred by Vex nimble interceptors. Instead, as they came close to one of the minor portals through which only small frigates could pass, they stared at the harshest angle they could execute. Though Vex blockades destroyed many of the fleet's ships with pinpoint fire, they could not halt the momentum of its massive capital ship. The Corsair slammed the Lananthriel's prow, bridge and all, straight into the portal. The rest of the spacecraft would not even come close to fitting through, however, sticking out like a greatsword shoved into a scabbard made for a dagger. A dozen blinding explosions burst into dazzling profusion across the neck of the great flagship as it ground into the spined crescent of the webway gate. The metaphysical forces unleashed by the collision were so powerful they ravaged the Lalanthriel inside and out. Proud corsairs were burned alive or sent flailing from the torn sides of the flagship, tumbling into the eternal night of the dark city to be blasted to atoms by the disintegrator fire of Vex hunters. A moment later, the stricken corpse of the Lanathriel was caught in the crossing beams of the Corspur's tractor pincers, solely hauled from the burning webway gate to be cored, scoured of life as a lesson to those who would defy Vect. With the supreme overlord city shaking in the grip of a disjunction, Vect wanted nothing more than to punish the perpetrator of the carnage. He watched from the observation galleries of his floating fortress, but swallowed down a scream of rage and frustration as the prow of the vast ship was drawn backward from the webway portal. It was all but intact, except for a perfectly circled hole cut in the vizier deck of the ship's elegantly tapering bridge. Vec did not need to wait for confirmation from his shadowy agents. Yvrain and her vanguard had gone, already lost in the labyrinth's dimensional tunnels, as sure as the rest of the flagship's crew would soon suffer an agonizing death in Rakath's hellish dungeons. In the webway, translucent passageways stretched before Evrain as she and her blood brides darted from one vista of impossible architecture to another. The crimson stranger was close behind, his incubi in tow, with the demon invasion ravaging much of Cormora. Vect would likely have a hundred contingencies put in motion, but would still be sending his agents to retrieve them. 
The sacrifice of the Corsair flagship had bought them a few critical hours, but that lead would be quickly eroded if their pursuers launched a mounted search party or used esoteric means to cut them off. They had no option but to head deeper into the webway. The ribbed tunnels of the labyrinth's dimension seemed to draw the trespassers onwards, lambent pulses of light gliding alongside them with a hypnotic motion. If Rain's vanguard, barely fifty strong, moved from wide arterial passageways to winding side passages and capillary tunnels that forced them to go in single file. The tunnels were dazzling and confusing to behold. Every unnatural angle and rune-sealed door reminded the trespassers that they did not belong here. All too often they felt eyes upon them, something staring intently at their intrusion, but the source they never found. The travellers were conscious that to stray from the relative safety of the arterial passageways into long-abandoned capillary tunnels was to invite disaster. Denorian fiends, emotion-eating medusa, chimera predators, and nests of Cytonuin infested those forgotten reaches. When the strains of a blizzard, lilting song floated through the tunnels, its tone mocking and unnatural, Ivrain feared something even worse. Much of the webway had been shattered by the fall, blasted apart by the devastating energies that had consumed the Empire of Old. Those broken spars had been largely destroyed by Cormorite cauterization raids or sealed off by the room portals of the craft worlders, for most led to the hellish dimension of the warp. In theory, the arterial passageways around Cormora were safe, but since the fall, the galactic labyrinth had been a ruined mockery of its former grandeur. Only the Laughing God, Segala, the only one of the original Eldar pantheon to truly survive the rise of Slaanesh, knew which parts were whole and which led to the domain of the great enemy. Several of Rivrain's blood brides had begun to age, complaining of the hunger gnawing inside them and testing their blades as they looked slyly at one another. Without the sustenance of suffering, the Dark Eldar would slowly shrink into themselves until they became parched, ravening ghouls desperate to feast on negative emotion. Even the most beautiful witch would be reduced to a torrid hag over the course of a few empty nights. A voice in Evrain's head laughed at their distress. It was that of a young male, quiet but cruel. The gladiatrix wondered if she had somehow absorbed the soul of the Garbat Helion she had slain. If so, she had kept the warrior's essence safe from the all-consuming desire of Slaanesh. If she could somehow master this process, or even teach it to others, she would have made a miraculous stride forward in the long battle for her race's salvation. It could allay the plight of the Dark Eldar and their endless soul hunger, but also the predicament of the craft worlders too. Should one individual be able to take the soul of another into themselves, he or she could act as a living refuge from she who thirsts. The Eldar would no longer need waystones, nor the limbo of the infinity circuit. The more she dwelt on the idea, the more animated she became. Here was possibility, hope perhaps. She strode purposefully on, possessed of such conviction that a fractious vanguard kept their pace. Further into the misty reaches of the webway they went, the unsettling song haunting their steps. As the time slipped by, the cold and sterile tunnels gave way to utter anarchy of form. Evrain's ragtag group ventured along spiral pathways that wound around the inside of the tunnels, with the travellers walking on the walls, on ceilings, or on stairs as insubstantial as shadows, yet capable of bearing their combined weight. Twisting deltas of passageways opened and narrowed once more, some opaque and humid, others made of crystal so transparent that a cosmos of swirling clouds and distant stars could be seen stretching into the void. The truth of what lay out there, in the twilight between reality and the warp, 
was so mind-boggling even an Eldar could not comprehend it. In some places, the mind's eye translated the scenes into an analogy of the physical galaxy lit in a dizzying profusion of colours and lights. In others, the skyscape was a collage of laughing faces, all blending and flowing one into another to form a grotesque tableau that could forever scar the memory. All the while that strange skirling song haunted their every step. Evraine had seen enough to know she was irrevocably lost. With no real destination in mind, she had bent her will to avoiding that which lay behind them rather than that which was ahead. Her blood brides were now openly quarrelling amongst themselves, their incendiary insults regarding each other's intimate practices giving way to spats of posturing and the rattling of blades. Ephiria Napsa launched a tirade of invective concerning Vilia the Talon's ancestry. So imaginative and surreal were Vilia's counterclaims that even Evraine found herself wide-eyed with amused surprise. Still, they were running out of time. With the dark Eldar desperate to feed, it would not be long before their vicious bickering boiled over into a minor massacre. About them, the walls of the webway glistened wetly, like the flayed flanks of some living thing. They had come to a dead end. A portal lay at the cul-de-sac center, the ruins of warding upon its oval circumference, smoking as if burned out no more than a matter of minutes ago. The swirling song sounded closer than ever, putting Evraine's nerves on edge. There was no other way forward. She pushed through the shimmering quicksilver of the gate, her blood rides at her heels. A demented scene greeted her, an image from some insane artist's nightmare. A hundred demonettes were dancing and frolicking with the corpses of Dark Elder in the colors of Vect's own cabal. The handmaidens of She Who Thirsts waltzed and span as if at a great ball, each holding a deceased cabalite in a lover's embrace. They were accompanied by a maddening flautist's duet. The interweaving melodies played on the thigh bones of Eldar from before the fall. As they danced, the demonets flayed the flesh from their victims with their razored claws, each gesture a languid caress that left the corpses dripping with gore. At the heart of it all was an elegant dancer holding the mask of tragedy and comedy on a long haft, the mask of Slanesh. Told of Evraine's flight by her besotted state agent, the veteran Sasarasen. Evraine's stomach churned, the panic screaming of the Hellion soul ringing loud in her mind. Outnumbered twice over, she was about to order the retreat when she saw a tall, stately demonette amongst the throng dancing ever swifter. Her spiraling pervain was somehow so entrancing Evraine could not look away. She felt an unsettling peace settle over her, a suffocating blanket of apathy that made her eyelids droop. Around her, blood brides and incubi were slumping, sitting cross-legged, and laying on the oddly pulsing tunnel floor as they were taken by the unnatural malaise of slumber that washed over them like a wave. Viria the Talon gave a small cry of despair, as plaintive as that of a dying swan, before lying down in a heap. Soon they would all become corpse puppets and a demonic revel. Suddenly, with jubilant cries, troop after troop of harlequin warrior dancers vaulted down from the tall ceiling, tumbling from clouds of glimmering mist, one after another in sprays of luminescent diamonds. Ivraine felt a jolt of pure energy wake her from her trance. She had hoped that her vanguard presence would pique the curiosity of Segura's warrior dancers sooner or later, and their intervention could not have been better timed. She raised her husk blade by way of greeting, then strode forward and took the head from the nearest demonette's neck. The dancing Diane at the heart of the demonette horde pirouetted faster, an expression of pure fury on her grotesque face. She sprang at unnatural speed towards the crimson incubi nearby, her fellow demons crooning and shrieking in her wake. The mercenary bladesmen, the blood brides, and even some of the harlequins were caught in the grip of her deathly slumber curse. Even the Vizark had succumbed, 
holding his head as if in the grip of a raging migraine. Yvain was already fighting hard against the hissing she-fiends. There was no way she could get past to aid her imperiled allies. As the mask of Sinesh dashed over the slumped corpse of an incubus in the livery of the Cabal of the Black Heart, she found her legs hooked out from under her by the fallen warrior's clavex. The incubus rose to his feet, laughing hollowly, his form shimmering as if caught in a heat mirage. He slewed off the illusion altogether to leave a lithe, hooded harlequin in his place, a solitaire, walker of the path of damnation. The mask of Sinesh gave a cry of disbelief and angst, spinning to slash a claw at the solitaire's midriff. Her adversary was already moving, punching a monofilament wire into the mask's neck before cartwheeling away, greatcoat billowing, to land in a sprinter's crouch. A split second later, the Harlequin launched forward like a living missile into the ranks of the demonettes. The solitaire shot from victim to victim so fast that it was impossible to trace him. The blur of his passage left explosions of purple ichor with every kill. Yvain and her blood brides, now free of the dancer's spell-binding curse, plunged into the ranks of the angered demonettes with blades flashing. The fiendish handmaidens leered at the prospect of fresh meat and charged to meet them. At first, the forces seemed evenly matched. Blood was drawn on both sides. Even a rain took a shallow cut across the throat. It stung like fury, but did not cut deep enough to do real harm. She spoke words of power, and thin tendrils of grey mist seeped from the Gladiatrix's wound. Their touch sapped the strength from the demonettes nearby, and turned their unreal flesh a lifeless grey. Yvain frowned in consternation, but seeing opportunity, pressed her assault. The fiendish handmaidens found their sadistic joy replaced by panic at the sight of Yvain's soul magic. The fugitives and their harlequin allies were now fighting every bit as fast as the lithe, whip-thin demons, if not faster. Blood flew, throats were slashed, and slain demons dissipated in clouds of sickly pink mist. On the left flank, the incubi were reaping bloody vengeance with their claves. On the right, the illusionary glamours of Harlequin's shadow seers turned demonettes upon one another instead of their intended foes. With the Dark Eldar counter-assault on one side and the Harlequin's killing spree on the other, the Sinashi trap had been broken. The mask threw back her head and gave a horrendous scream. The sound was so loud it shattered a section of the webway wall behind her. A gale of psychic emanations roared into the tunnels, swirling into a tornado that carried the demonettes and their queen away and out of sight in the space of a few terrifying moments. The Eldar fought to keep their footing, embedding their blades and fingernails in the psychoplastic crystal of the tunnel's walls. The solitaire strode through the gale as if there were no more than a summer's breeze, fingers outstretched to draw a complex rune of warding over the breach. With a sigh of relief, the troop's shadow master turned the ebbing gale of energy into a harmless sparkling mist. Yvain and her warriors regained their composure slowly, picking themselves up and regrouping. The entire altercation had taken no more than a minute. They had lost several of their number in the fighting, but without the intervention of the Harlequins, they would almost certainly have died. Yvain scanned the thinning mists for movement, intending to thank her enigmatic saviors. Only one of them, the solitaire, could be seen. That lone warrior had sent something potent beyond measure in his reign. After a brief exchange with his fellows, he chose to remain as a guide. The others vanished into the depths of the webway to meet with a living legend, a famed warrior matriarch whose part was yet to be played. Dire Tidings for Bealtan the Harlequins of the Midnight Sorrow were already leagues distant from Yvain's vanguard by the time the solitaire led the travellers into the labyrinth. Their intended destination was deep in the realm mankind called Ultima Segmentum, for there lay a jewel in the shattered crown of the Eldar's legacy. They made for Bealtan, a world ship that seeks to unite its disparate race in what others consider a lost cause. Craftworld Bealtan whose name translates as the rebirth of ancient days, is the most militant and proud of all its kind. Violently xenophobic and mistrustful of the lesser races, 
the vast world ship protects its holdings with a vengeful fury. Beotown casts itself as the guardian of the maiden world, whose primeval planets where the Eldar Exodites live, in harmony with their environment, and upon their death join with the world spirit of the planet instead. The bellicose people of Beotown believe the Exodite worlds will be the seeds that flourish into a new order when the Eldar rise again to prominence. Many craft worlds consider the Beotani delusional. The resources and manpower needed to successfully turn those paradise worlds into an echo of the former empire were long ago consumed. Undeterred by these naysayers, the Beotani cling onto their convictions as a wounded warrior holds tightly onto his sword. Though few in Cormara realized it, Beotan was the original home of the one they called the Daughter of Shades. Under the world ship's glowing domes and elegant spires, Evelyn was raised, nurtured, and taught the ways of the craft worlds. At first, she walked the path of the performer. Her intricate acrobatics thrilling high society, as well as her fellow wanderers of the craft world's abandoned zones. Her displays grew faster and more violent as she became more headstrong. When the avatar of Cain was roused within the craft world's heart during the invasion of Gnosis Prime, she took the path of the warrior, becoming a dire avenger under the tutelage of famously deadly Laerian star speaker, Exarch of the Silvered Blade Shrine. Long years slipped past. The blood of rain shed as part of Beotan's famous sword wind should have been enough to sate even the most savage spirit, but it was not enough. Restless, she sought a deeper connection to the infinite. For a time, the path of the warlock gave her the esoteric understanding she craved, honing her psychic skills while still giving her a chance to fight in Beotan's armies. The witch path, too, she forsook, becoming an outcast, then a famed corsair admiral, and finally, after her hubris led to mutiny, an arena fighter in Cormora. Yet Beotan has always had a place in her heart, and vice versa. With a solitaire she had counted in the webway guiding her, the prodigal daughter's homecoming was close at hand. Beotan's struggling ambition was well known. In a vain, the mask of the midnight sorrow believed they had found a way to make that ambition a reality. The gladiatrix bore a peculiar aura, and the shadow seer had marked it well. Her use of deathly powers in the battle against a demonette had confirmed an eventuality foreseen by the troop's patron, Eldred Ulthran. The crux point of causality had been exactly where the Farsi had seen it would be, and Vane had manifested power from beyond the veil just as foreseen. Her safe arrival to a sympathetic audience was paramount. As Eldred had said, the Harlequins must entangle the strands of fate that stretched before her if they were to be weaved into a greater thread, and ultimately become a silken noose strong enough to destroy Slanesh. Months previously, secreted in vaults of black racebone within Craftworld Ulthway, Eldred had foreseen much of that which was coming to pass. Following the ripples in the fabric of the future that he himself had caused upon Cohiria, he saw a new force rising, embodied in one called the Daughter of Shades. She alone held the key to Inyad's ascension and the cosmic upheaval Eldred and Cassidras had long predicted. Pursuing Ivrain's thread of fate in his meditations, Eldred deemed there was no haven more likely to take this living phenomenon into their heartlands than Bealtan. Even then, Eldred had seen the reborn gladiatrix and the ruling caste of the craft world bound together on an altogether deeper and more spiritual level. Another nexus point of destiny approached, the skein of fate knotted and tensed around it. As he refined his divinations, Eldred had seen the ruin of the Night Maiden circled by the fall from grace, both in turn orbiting the heraldric rune of Beeltan itself. Ominously, the stylized heart that sat within the craft world's rune had smoldered and turned black. Such was the price of progress. The High Farseer had sent a psychic signal across the vastness of the webway. In doing so, 
dispatching the only agents he could truly trust to work to a greater goal. So it was the Mask of the Midnight Sorrow had made haste through the webway to Bealtan, their intent to pave the way for Evrain's arrival. Though the Mask of the Midnight Sorrow had lately garnered a reputation as self-centered thieves and bearers of ill tidings, the message they brought to Bealtan was of such dire import it could not be ignored. The Autark Meliniel consulted with the craft world's high farcia, Lathriel, even as the craft world's aspect warrior host, known as the Swordwind, was mobilized for war. Lathriel's own runic divinations, when carefully interpreted with the Harlequin's message in mind, spoke of a baleful truth. Much like Eldred, she saw a fork in the destiny of her people, one route leading to blazing fire, the sign of the Rana Dandra, the end of days, while the other to a darkened veil and the sound of a morning bell. The implications were staggering. Perhaps the whispered notion of Inead's ascension could stave off the Elder's destruction for a time, and maybe even calm the warp storms ravaging the galaxy. The newcomer the Harlequin spoke of was central to this concept. Bound tightly to the ruins of the great enemy and Beotan itself, it was likely the agents of Stanish too were aware of the importance of the interloper, this daughter of Shades, and intended to seize her themselves. Until now, the runes of warding that protected the craft world had made the idea of a demonic incursion the stuff of nightmares, not reality. With Imperian tempests raging across the segmentum, however, there was a chance of a webway bridge. Should a host of warp spawn set foot upon the craft world, the sheer magnitude of the disaster that would follow did not bear thinking about. A full demon invasion could see the craft world lying in ashes, never to recover. The Mask of Slaanesh was well aware of this opportunity. She had learned of a route of ingress to Bealtan, a long-sealed webway tunnel that led from an abandoned extremity of the craft world to the gates of the maiden world, Asulia. Paradise Corrupt Asulia, named after a famous beautiful maiden of myth, was a small but verdant world, famous in Eldar society for its majestic thornwoods and towering arbor cities. It had been fashioned as a true paradise by the Eldari, but had been twisted beyond recognition. To descend through the silver cloud banks of Asulia skies was to feel a great sadness of the soul. Roiling warp storms had lashed its surface in the last few months, appearing from nowhere like a seismic eruption upon an unseen fault line. Asulia's glorious waterfalls had been turned to swathes of crimson glass, and its rolling dales reduced to skull-strewn wastelands. Amongst the Prad's valleys was a moss-strewn henge known as the Obsidian Gate. This former webway route was permanently closed many thousands of years ago as a precautionary measure against invasion, for it led straight to Bealtan. The decision to seal it had since been vindicated a dozen times over. For gentle Asulia had known many wars over the millennia, yet it was theoretically possible that the route could be reopened by arcane force. It was a possibility the Beltani would do anything to avoid. For the warriors of Bealtan, to make planet fall upon Ursulia was much like looking upon the face of a once beautiful dilettante, badly burned by some horrific twist of fate. The craft worlders did not take the loss well. Expressions had hardened to stony scowls under the hoods of those rangers searching the twisted forests for Exodite survivors. They had found only death. In the space it had taken for Bealtan's outriders to arrive at Ursulia, the planet had already suffered beyond comprehension. Under detailed instructions from Autark Meliniel, the warriors of the Sword Wind were en route to aerial ambush points in their falcon and wave serpent skimmers. Underneath their helms, the faces of the Aspic warriors remained cold and impassive. They had donned their war masks before leaving the craft world embodying the aspect of Cain's inhumanly focused killers. Only once the battle was over would they assume their fully emotive personas once more, allowing themselves to grieve. 
rain hammered down as the sword wind's transport shot through the skies. The convoy of vehicles was all but invisible in their cloud strike formation. This was common practice amongst the Biotani, for they believe the blade unseen strikes truest of all. Around the graf tanks, a tempest was brewing, the disturbing keening of the wind hinting at some unnatural energy beneath it. The tang of ozone hung heavy in the air, a sense of doom gathering like the closeness before a thunderstorm. The sword wind of Bealtan had sent a thousand warriors to Usulia, yet in the heart of every warrior there was a sense they had already lost. They had watched over this hidden world for millennia, and in doing so had repelled orc invasions, Hrad infestations, imperial conquests, and dark Eldar raids. Against the raw power and sudden onset of a chaos tempest, however, there was little they could do. Warpstorm Balamet had flared into baleful existence so swiftly that even the Eldar could not counter it. What was intended as a mission of rescue had become one of vengeance, and of preventing the same fate befalling Biltan should the unthinkable happen. The Mask of Slanesh was poised to achieve just that. Though it had cost her much to attain it, she had masterminded a full-scale demonic invasion of Asulia. Her intent was not to conquer the planet, but to use it as a staging post. Should she muster force enough to break through the Obsidian Gate, she would reach Bealtan before Ivrain, not only claiming a rich bounty of Eldar souls, but also capturing or devouring the single greatest threat to Slanesh's existence. The Demon Herald had taken great pains to arrange the conquest to come, and ensure it had a semblance of focus. No mean feat concerning the rival forces involved. The Mask had marshalled not only her own great promenade of excess, a gathering of demonets, seekers, chariots, and half-mortal hell flares, but also seduced a grand battalion of cornate demons into fighting for the same corns. The rivalries between the Chaos Guards had raged across reality and the warp for time immemorial, Though the brothers in darkness were each locked in their great game, and though they sought the same destructive ends more often than not, they were such bitter rivals that they held an open contempt for each other. This ire often boiled over into outright war. Sanesh, the master excess, was considered a self-indulgent, preening impostor by the blood god Korn. Conversely, Sanesh saw the blood god as an unimaginative boar, with all the grace of a starving hound. Their demon minions harbored much the same attitudes, for in essence, a demon is but a fragment of its Chaos Guard patron made manifest. The Mask of Slanesh was nothing if not persuasive, however, and her repertoire went far beyond the pleasures of the flesh. She knew well how to exploit the compulsions of others, for she was obsession given form. The Songless souls were often the easiest to fool, Hubris and overconfidence was the downfall of champions and wise men alike. The demon lords of chaos were prideful indeed. It was that flaw that the mask sought to play upon, thereby binding them to her cause. With the power of chaos ascendant and warp tempest raging across the breadth of mankind's realm, demons found moving from the warp to the storm-wracked domains of real space easier than ever, especially for one as adroit as the mask. Still, there was no way she had the strength to break open the wounds of warding that sealed the portal to Beotan. She knew of but one demon strong enough to break the arcane defenses, Scarbrand the Exile, the most terrible bloodthirster of them all. Even then, his power might not suffice. Scarbrand was a demon whose arrogance was so immense that he sought to slay his own deity in single combat. He was hurled across reality as a result, broken in body and mind. All that was left of Scarbrand was rage, raw and all-consuming. Seeing in the infamous demon an instrument of pure brute force, the mask had sought the bloodthirster out, dancing her way through the realm of chaos to speak to him face to disfigured face. At first, Scarbrand sought to cut the mask to pieces with his twin axes, slaughter and carnage. However, the demon had swayed and dodged from the bloodthirster's blows with such sublime passivity that Scarbrand stopped viewing her as a martial opponent 
and instead saw her as more of an inconvenience, just as a rampaging stallion might see a gadfly upon its flank. When he had all but lost interest, the mask told her foe of her own exile, for she had been banished by her god, just as Scarbrand had been banished by his. This won the raging demon's ear for a time. She spoke to him of a great wager, a contest between the demon hosts of Slaanesh and those of Corn. The competition would be held upon the world of Asudia, whosoever claimed the most elder lies in the name of their patron before nightfall would be proved the most powerful in the service of their respective guards. The demon herald's words were expertly delivered. Her beguilements were clever enough to stoke Scarbrand's eternal rage, but not to trigger a killing spree. Not yet, at least. The greater demon spat, snarled and roared with contempt, for the disciples of Corn did not idly ignore a challenge to their strength. With her greater plan set in motion, the mask smiled from ear to ear, waltzing away to amass her followers, even as the mighty bloodthirster stomped off on his own warpath. Within a week of that incongruous pact, the demon hosts of the mask and Scarbrand trod the peaty loam of Ursula's twisted forests. Their warp-born followers numbered in the hundreds of thousands, for word of the wager had brought a great many champions together, each determined to outclass their gods' rivals with impressive acts of slaughter. As the demons burst from within the eye of Ursulia's fiercest psychic storm, the invasion had begun in earnest. The Exodites defending their world had used every weapon, trick and trap at their disposal, unleashing hordes of roaring megasaurs and mounting mass cavalry charges that saw whole households of dragon knights charge into echelons of demonic foot soldiers. Theirs was a noble act of defiance, but ultimately it was doomed. The invading host outnumbered them twice over, and with the mask and Scarbrand at the fore, the Exodite defenders were overwhelmed in a matter of days. When the Swordwind of Beeltarn arrived, the Exodites had all but been eradicated. Demons already convorted and guzzled hot blood amongst the twisted ruins, many counting the dead or arguing amongst themselves as to which of their number was the deadliest. The mask was still on the hunt, coordinating her plans with a choreographer's artistry. Her seeker parties had located the obsidian gate on a ridge overlooking the green lush valleys not a moment too soon. She knew the Eldar well and suspected that not only would the Exodite's craft world cousins attack soon, but that in their haste to defend the portal, they would give her the chance she needed to break through it. It has long been said by the gossips of the Slaneshi courts that Scarbrand's bitterness and frustration at his fall from grace lent him strength. When the Beltani sought to bring him down, his mounting anger, bolstered by the eldritch power of the warp storm that lashed Ursulia, should give him might enough to break through any barrier. This evil contest of demons was about to escalate massively, for the slaughter was by no means at an end. By the time the storm abated, the death toll on both sides would have reached truly shocking heights. Demon Storm Howling, crying and screaming they came, blades gripped tight and snarling smiles displayed pointed teeth. The demon hordes of Sinesh and Corn scoured the twisted forests of Ursulia for more heads to claim. A cruel frenzy was upon them, the jives and imprecations cast aside in their desperate need to prove their supremacy. With the psychic tempest raging all around, the demons paid little heed to the craft world forces descending through the clouds. Only the mask watched the heavens from the corner of her coal black eyes. She knew full well that Beeltarn could not help but take the bait she had laid so carefully before them. They would attack with pitiless fury, as they always did, and in doing so, they would not drive off their foes, but trigger a devastating counterattack. Slanesh revels in every kind of excess, especially that which involves the spilling of vital fluids. Corn, for his part, is empowered just as much by the slaughter of his own armies as he is those of his enemies. The same could be said of his minions. Blood was blood no matter his provenance. 
The Eldar attack was sudden and devastatingly effective. At a single word from the Autarch, Meliniel, the sword wind died from the skies. Pulse lasers and plasma weapons flickering in such profusion, it seemed a hail of killing light slanted down from the heavens alongside the scores of ectoplasmic liquid. Explosions blossomed through the canopies of the forest, blasting grotesque anatomies high into the air. Each fusillade was aimed not at the larger throngs of warp creatures darting through the twisted foliage, but the largest and most elaborately ornamented of their number. The Swordwind had long practiced the strategy of assassination as a way to even the odds for their small but elite forces. Despite the ethereal nature of the demon hosts, the same strategy worked on the immortal legions of the great enemy. Within seconds, the Eldar had slain dozens of the heralds that had given a semblance of leadership to the demon hordes. It was then that the Eldar launched a multifaceted assault, devised by Autarch Meliniel in the space of a few intense minutes once he had ascertained the disposition of the demonic hordes. Marshalling his troops into several war hosts, his layered attack saw the cloud-born Eldar encircle the demon warbands close to the obsidian gate. First to press home the assault were the Eldruth and Falshu, the flight of falcons. Tight squadrons of grav tanks veered through the splashing rain to engage the soul grinders smashing aside corrupted foliage in their haste to close with their attackers. The demon engines spat a hideous amount of firepower into the skies, their harvester cannons sending dirty chain explosions into the oncoming war host's path, but their fire was largely ineffective. The sheer speed of the surprise attack had robbed their fire of any real accuracy. At the fore of the airborne assault came the Crimson Death. Two squadrons of nightshade interceptors shone like wedges of polished ruby in the sky, weaving to and fro with the grace of raptors on the hunt. One of the elegant craft was torn from the sky by lucky shot, its wreckage spiraling knives as psychoplastic that stabbed into the jungle below. The others evaded the fusillades with barrel rolls and steep dives. At the last moment, the scarlet craft crisscrossed one another in a series of interlocking attack runs, their bright lances stabbing pinpoint death into the ranks of the enraged soul grinders. The attack was intended to blind the giant demon engines, just as Cain's hurled blades took the eyes from the white worm, Ogonothir. In practice, their laser beams were so vicious they took the heads from most of the iron-skinned monstrosities as they struck. The clanking, piston-legged advance of the war engines slowly came to a halt as their demonic animas were violently unbound from their flesh-metal bodies and ripped away into the Eldridge storm. The Crimson Death was already gone, the clouds spiraling in their wake. Seeing their anti-air firepower snatched away, the demons of the greater host gave a roar of frustration so loud it caused the foliage all about to shake and shiver. Their bows and shrieks were answered by the sizzling hisses of laser beams from the grav tanks that descended by the dozen in the Crimson Death's wake. With their hollow fields blending them into the cloud banks behind, and a canopy of weird organic foliage covering much of the sky, Millennial's cloud strike squadrons were all but invisible. Only when the killing began did the demons realize the doom that was upon them. Fire prisms sent lancing beams of killing energy into demonic riders that were crashing through the forests atop brass-bound juggernauts. The laser shot, concentrated by exotic crystal focusing arrays, blasting great craters into their enemy host, their edges steaming with boiling demonic remains. The brazen corpse stuff left over from each strike bubbled away into little more than the stench of brimstone and hot brass. Roaring down from the skies came Scarbrand himself, plummeting from the warp into reality in a trailing ball of flame. The carnage had drawn him as surely as a sky shark is drawn to magic in the air. With a thunderous boom, he smashed through a squadron of grav tanks, sending their mangled hulls spinning and landing hard in the valley. Elder trees were blasted to splinters at the impact, and scarlet fires burned in his wake. Scarbrand stormed out of his impact crater, axes swinging to lay low the lesser demons scrambling out of the way. The giant demon made a choice target for the gunners of the Eldar Graf tanks, 
Many a blinding beam lanced into Scarbrand, but they just made him all the angrier. As the grav tanks hit from above, the windrider jet bikes of the Beotan host were riding into the wide mouth of the Greenlush Valley. Taking aim at the greater host, they leveled such a fierce hurricane of razor edged shuriken that they sliced down plant and demon alike. The war for Assyria was raging once more. The Tempest of Blades. The Windrider host, well used to striking their enemies at speed, made ready to peel off and attack further down the line. Against a mortal enemy, they would no doubt have proven swift enough. The demons of Slanesh, however, were no normal foes. Out from the massed ranks of demonettes darted a flock of seekers, long-limbed bipedal steeds with bejeweled riders atop them. Shrilling and hooting, the beasts ran at impossible speed alongside the racing jet bikes before they could pull away, lashing them with long, ropey tongues and pulling the Eldar from their saddles. Close behind were seeker chariots festooned with spinning, scything blades. Those wind riders, still lying dazed on the forest floor, were unceremoniously slashed to ribbons, their violated body parts strewn across the loom. Monitoring the counterattack from the passenger bay of his grav tank, Autark Millennial ordered his elite troops into the fray. The war host known as the Coiled Serpent, translated in the Eldar tongue as Thielan Aksaim, drove forward into the enemy flank. Its mass wave serpents disgorged hundreds of aspect warriors. Every color and shape of Cain's war aspect was suddenly on the attack, their armor vibrant and strong amongst the sickly hues of Asulia's corrupted forests. First came the swooping hawks, darting from blue-gray clouds so similar in hue to their armor the winged warriors seemed no more than flickers at the limit of vision. From their thigh holsters, they dispersed small but powerful grenades, falling like acorns from a gale-tossed oak. They landed within the mass of cornate demons at the edge of the cliff. Where they struck home, spheres of crackling white plasma appeared, each string of explosions hurling mutilated red-skinned bodies into one another before they discorporated entirely. Laz blast of fire stabbed down to reap the tally anew. By the time the cornate demon cannons had ground their way up a nearby ridge to retaliate, the swooping hawks were gone. In their place came warp spiders, materializing behind the cannon batteries without a sound. They fired tangled webs of monofilament, wire so sharp that they cut through demon flesh and hell-forged brass alike. Then, in a crackling of unlight, the warp spiders too were gone. Down in the valley, the Sinishi counterattack was fierce. A crowd of lithe demonettes charged the aspect warrior host, hissing with glee at the prospect of a rich banquet of souls. The first wave pressed towards the rematerialized warp spiders that had taken such a toll on the cornate demons on the ridge. The Sinishi host screaming loudly to draw the focus of their enemies. The aspect warriors opened fire once more. A fusillade of monofilament wire engulfing the fiends to carve them to disturbingly bloodless chunks. But the distraction had played its part. A second war band of the she demons, having slunk close and climbed into a, a copse of spiked trees, dropped shrieking on the warp spiders from above. Several of the fearless Eldar were ripped apart, the severed limbs cast with abandon into the air. The rest simply vanished, triggering their warp jump generators to reappear with a flicker of light some hundred feet distant. The celebrating demonettes were left confused and wrong-footed. They hissed blame at one another as they cast about for more victims, only to be greeted by a devastating fusillade from the dark reapers stationed within the walkway of an arboreal palace. Reaper missiles detonated in the demons' midst, a chain of explosion so fierce it blew apart the iron-hard fungi of the valley even as it tore through dozens of the demonettes taking shelter amongst them. The thumping boom had barely faded from the valley walls before another Slanishi attack raced in, a wave of demonic cavalry with demon chariots racing close behind. Another squad of wave serpents closed in, as Millennial reacted to this new assault by directing the mounted counterattack known as the Fedhin Sim Zalakain. Whilst the demon cavalry sprinted on, a shrine of dire avengers disembarked with smooth swiftness 
to unleash a storm of shuriken at the seekers racing past. Monomolecular discs slashed out by the thousand, even as the enemy cavaliers rode their lithe steeds close. Not even the preternaturally nimble demons of Slaanesh could avoid a salvo delivered with such expertise. The demons were sliced to ribbons, much as their charioteer Sistren had cut apart the Windrider guardians mere moments before, fresh flying from their bodies. Whilst the dire Avengers were reloading, those seekers had made it through the hurricane of firepower darted into lash and slice, laying high-crested warriors low. The shrine's exarch stepped in to duel the riders at close quarters, taking the snake-fast blows of their opponents with shimmering force shields before ending the threat with thrusts of their swords and power spears. The chariots in the seekers' wake burst through the ectoplasmic mist that was all that remained of their vanguard, blades wickering, and riders hunkered down as to avoid another shuriken assault. A trio of wave serpents glided smoothly from a natural boulevard, spinning to reveal their hull doors. The fire dragons inside stepped out and formed a line, forcing their zen-like focus into lethal accuracy as the demon machines careened in close. Their exarch spoke a single word. A moment later, chariots and riders were vaporized in hissing streams of ichor, Molten metal spattering and hissing from the bright orange plates of the fire dragons. One lone Selenishi demon made it past the newly formed battle line to engage the dark reapers in the arbor behind, leaping from the burning remains of her chariot to swing from a low bow and vault into the midst of the heavy weapon team. With their cumbersome missile launchers and reinforced armor, the dark reapers were easy prey for the slashing spinning allures. Claws darting, she claimed the lives of four aspect warriors before a heavy kick sent her tumbling into the fires below. At the obsidian gate on the shoulders of the valley, the demons of corn had run down and decapitated every Eldar ranger sent to keep them from the great fight. First one, then three, then eight blood-letter warbands charged down the forested slope towards the battle. It was an eventuality Autark Millenniel had foreseen and his warriors fell back with fluid grace to the transports waiting nearby. Watching from the valley's edge, the mask hissed in frustration. She shrieked a hunt and retrieve order to her chariots. For a plan to work, the elder had to contest the henge itself. Nearby, Scarbrand was hacking his way through a war band of demonets and a ball of flame of white-hot anger. He loped past the obsidian gate to look with longing at the expansive carnage in the valley. The mask had lured him there by insisting that the fighting would be fiercest outside the portal, and the brute had taken the bait. Now that ploy might come to naught, for the Eldar were falling back. Something had to be done, or the bloodthirster was likely to dive into the fight half a mile from the location where the mask needed him most. In less than a minute, the mask's chosen charioteers had returned. The mangled bodies of three fallen warlocks laid across their yokes. The vehicle slewed to a halt as the mask leapt nimbly atop the mossy capstone of the obsidian gate, and the riders tossed the psychers' corpses up to their mistress as if they were little more than storm-filled effigies. The mask gave a piercing cry of delight. Plucking the glowing spirit stones from the best plate of each psychers' armor, and sliding them down her throat one after another, as a greedy gourmet might guzzle a dish of oysters. The herald's grandstanding did not go unnoticed. Three squadrons of speeding grav tanks changed direction, spearing in with their guns spitting death. The mask danced and dodged, cackling with glee as the skimmers came in low. Scarband leapt high, his axes arcing in a tremendous overhead blow. They smashed into the first grav tank so hard it came apart in a double fireball of burning wreckage that smashed into the cliff beyond. Aspect warriors tumbled out, stunned and broken, to land on the alien foliage below. The demons of Slaanesh and Korn alike fell upon them, thrashing and slicing, desperate to claim their heads. Nearby, jet-bike riding signing spears charged in, opening fire and withdrew, expertly drawing the demons away with bait-and-switch maneuvers. Autark Millenniel had watched the violations of his kin spirits upon the obsidian gate with utmost horror. 
With a thunder of Cain's fury in his blood, he issued another series of curt orders to his exarchs. His wise and careful plan to draw the demons into his guns piecemeal was all but abandoned. Now his strategy became one of all-out assault. In his haste to make the demonette herald pay for the hideous act, the Autarch ordered his own squadron to close upon the obsidian gate. The leaders of the enemy armies had gathered there, not only the Sarnishi demon, but a heavily scarred bloodthirster that glowed with ruddy light every time the storm scream winds billowed past it. With enough concentration of force, Belenial reasoned, the sword wind could deal a death blow to the enemy's cohesion and take revenge for those souls torn away from the salvation of the Infinity Circuit. The demon hordes would be far easier to stymie without destruction, and perhaps even turn upon themselves, as his sister Lathriel had intimated they would. The Autarch commanded his Sunstorm squadrons to combine their fire, highlighting Scarbrand as their target, while designating the Mask as a priority kill for his remaining outcast snipers. Ranger fire spat from the high hills in response. Each needle-thin burst of laser fire met with puffs of ichor from the dancing demonet's flesh. Glutted with soul stuff after her dark feast, however, the mask was proving resilient. The fire prisms, coming around for another attack run along the valley, glowed bright. The complex laser cannons of the rear grav tanks channeling their fire into the giant crystals of the skimmers of the fore. Beams of energy blasted out, each so thick it could have punched through a craft world's wraithbone superstructure. Yet they were delivered with pinpoint precision. Three, four, five of the macro beams burned into Scarbrand, their energy so bright they hurt to behold, even from several leagues distant. The bloodthirster paused in his slaughter of the nearby aspect warriors, gritting his fang-like teeth as more and more energy poured into him. Glowing like a red sun, Scarbrand roared. His skin sizzled away as light poured out from his flesh. Every nearby demon save the mask had been burned away by the terrible firestorm. Bloodletters and demonettes alike blasted into nothingness. Scarband staggered away, but the pitiless laser barrage followed his every step. The greater demon's rage grew incandescent, stoked to the heights of apoplexy by the unwelcome thought that he might be slain so early on in the bloodshed with a meagre skull tally of less than a hundred or so to his name. Incensed, he cast his monstrous gaze around for something to kill. All he could see was the mask, laughing cruelly at him from atop the lintel of the obsidian gate. Scarban lashed out with all his strength, the demon axes slaughter and carnage arcing towards the mask. At the last moment, she leapt in a backward somersault, evading the blow. The axes smashed through the lintel of the obsidian gate with force enough to shatter it, runes and all, to red-hot flinders. In an instant, the long-sealed webway portal was ripped wide, a swirling tunnel of amber light stretching impossibly into the cliff face. Into the portal dived the mask, her demonette hosts pouring through the gate behind her in a river of milk-white flesh. Autark Millennial felt panic rise in his throat, his impassioned insistence that the demons would not breach that ancient webway gate now seemed the folly of a proud youth. Even as he watched, the demon infection of chaos bled into the webway, no doubt already making speed for the very heart of Beeltarn. He felt the mind's eye of his sister, Lathriel, play across his thoughts. Seizing the opportunity, he sent a pulse of alarm through the ether towards her. Beeltarn was in dire peril. Its protectors must be readied, for within a matter of hours the craft world would be invaded by its worst nemeses. Though the mask had accomplished her goal, the battle for Ursulia raged on. The aspect warriors under orders from their autarch concentrated their efforts on the obsidian gate. The ruses they had used to draw the demons away from the crucial location were now abandoned and now all they could do was limit the number of demons that broke through the wapeway. And again and again, they launched their assaults upon Scarbrand, but the monstrous bloodthirster only grew more invigorated as the fires of his anger were stoked ever higher. He ripped through battle lines of dire avengers, burned through shimmering webways of monofilament coil, and smashed grav tanks left and right, 
whenever they passed within reach of his cruel axes. Before long, though, it was not the Eldar that Scarbrand sought to slay, but the demons of Slaanesh. He now realized he had been tricked into acting as the mask's pawn, and that she had no intention of comparing kill tallies at the end of the day's slaughter. He plunged through the obsidian gate into the webway beyond, intent on revenge. The sheer unbridled mayhem that Scarbrand left in his wake drew hundreds, then thousands of demons towards the circle of standing stones. A horde of bloodletters and skull crushers charged up towards the webway portal from the ground below, a trio of greater demons storming in their midst. The steep slope gave no pause to creatures that had no notion of tiredness or exhaustion, and even though opportunistic attacks from windriders, aspic warriors and grav tanks hurled demons back down the cliff by the dozen, the elder was soon outnumbered five to one. With a heavy heart, Ortak Millennial realized the battle could not be won without blunting the sword wind for decades to come. The obsidian gate was still in the hands of the enemies, and more and more slanishy demons were using the cover of the fresh coronate assault as a cover to slip into the webway unhindered. Such a tremendous influx of demons could not be allowed to pass through the obsidian gate, for the mask's incursion would turn from a few hundred demons to a massed invasion. There was only one course of action left. With a curt order, the Autark commanded his Sunstorm squadrons to concentrate their fire upon the obsidian gate itself. With its protective runes shattered by Scarbrand's mighty blow, it was vulnerable to conventional attack. One after another, the macro beam shot out. Demons died by the score as a backwash of tremendous energies rushed onwards. The runes that had previously sealed the portal aglow once more as the stone burned from within. Then, with a titanic boom, the obsidian gate exploded. The Eldar were already withdrawing, running hard to their grav tanks and escaping away into the skies. Millennial had ordered an immediate retreat. Though the sword wind valued the Exodite worlds highly, the craft world itself was in dire peril. Biotan was running out of time. The Coming of Eldar Souls Upon craft world Biotan, the air thrummed with aggression. Every soul upon the continent-sized ship had a raising need to kill. The Avatar was stirring, and the Biotani felt his awakening within their veins. Millennial's message, delivered via the psychic link she shared with his Farseer sister, Lasriel, had put into motion a chain of events that had galvanized the entire craft world. Somewhere in the webway that led from the craft world was host of Stanishi demons. Biotan could be mere moments from invasion, not only from the great enemy, but also the blood god's minions, obeying hosts of killers hungry for war. Though there was only one swift pathway to Asulia, dozens of small offshoots led from the mazes of the webway to portals upon Biltan. Should any one of these gates be destroyed or corrupted, it could buckle the fabric of the world ship itself, damning the entire structure to a slow metaphysical death. Though it seemed drastic beyond measure, and though many expressed concerns, Lathriel and the Beltani Seer Council reacted to Millennial's warning by runically sealing every webway gate upon the craft world, save the great portal that glowed in the darkness of space at the craft world's stern. That vast arterial gateway, the vector through which Biotan launched its mightiest invasions, was left under heavy guard. A full third of the craft world's armada stood ready to destroy the gate, along with any demonic force that used it as a route of ingress. Better to cauterize a gangrenous limb, said the seers, than risk losing the entire body. When the mask attack came, it was far more insidious than a straightforward invasion. A band of rangers in a sleek outrigger ship sent through the webway by Autark Millennial, with orders to monitor the demon incursion's progression at a distance, flickered into being through the stern portal and drifted down to the craft world's docks. It made port through the irising roof of the gateway dome below. Unbeknownst to the Elder, the mask herself clung to the underside. Demons need no air to breathe, 
nor did they feel the cold of the interstellar void, and with the Empyrean raging storm, she could exist in real space for some time. Once past the port's armed cordon, the Herald dropped from the underside of the message ship and drifted gracefully down like a pearl diver in search of undersea treasure. Before long, the mask had found her way inside the craft world. Any who set eyes upon her found their darkest obsessions consuming them. Like some baleful hypnotist, she bound one warrior after another into her wake. As her dance went on, the troubled expressions of those in her thrall began to twitch, then to turn to rictuses of horrid glee. The mask caressed them with her claws, crooning an infernal summons, one by one. The captured Eldar were possessed by the demonettes that answered the mask's call, flesh transmuting to become that of the demon queen's own handmaidens. Slowly, unstoppably, the mask's enrapturing dance took her to the very heart of the craft world. None were able to resist her lure, for all Eldar have within them a seed of the obsessive spirit that led to Slanish's birth so long ago. Unhindered, she reached the Iron Chamber where the Avatar slumbered, when the craft world was not at war. The zone at its heart was empty, for the titanic living statue was elsewhere, already locked in battle with Scarbrand. The mask chuckled to herself, skipping over to the great Iron Throne and sat, legs folded like those of a prim maiden, to summon more of her kind. A shrine of howling banshees came upon the parasitic impostor at the heart of the craft world. Led by the Farseer, Hedae, after her rune casting revealed the gruesome truth, the aspect warriors charged, screaming into the open throne room, blades raised. The first few howling banshees to charge the mask and her demon cohort made the mistake of meeting her gaze, and fell to a swaying dance immediately, stumbling to their knees in supplication. Hedae, found her protective ghost helm burning so hot with clashing psychic energies she was forced to take it off. One glance from the mask, and she fell under the demon's spell. The avatar's chamber was split by a deafening shriek. It was not the mocking cry of a demon, but a clear and piercing scream that grew to my numbing volume. A towering warrior charged into the fray, long hafted blade whipping left and right to decapitate a demonette with every strike. The mask, finding her spell ineffectual, jumped high with claws outstretched. Up came the pole arm of the newcomer, fast as thought, impaling the demon against the iron ceiling of the throne room. Jane of Zar, sent to intercept the mask by her Harlequin allies, had come at the last. Her intervention was too late. By digging her rune-inscribed claws into the wraith-bone roots of the Avatar's throne room, the mask had already breached the sanctity of Beeltan's infinity circuit, infecting it from within. Her handmaidens had followed suit, leaving their physical forms to pass into their infinity circuit, in such numbers its innate defenses could not repel them. Beeltan had been taken to the brink of disaster. A world ship fractured. The most integral part of any Eldar craft world is its infinity circuit, that wraithbone core that runs like a skeleton throughout the immense structure, forming a limbo-like haven for the souls of the craft world's dead. This is usually protected by the teleporting, psychocrystalline creatures known as warp spiders, yet the demon infestation spread by the mask was so severe even they could not hold it at bay. The craft world groaned like a living thing, a terrible screaming haunting the cusp of hearing as a demon host devoured the spirits of Baltan's ancient dead. As battles broke out between demon invaders and elder defenders, rivers of hot blood ran between the spires and colonnades of the world ship's domes. With Millennia's forewarning and the Phoenix Lord Jaina Zar leading the counterattack, the demons of Korn and Sinesh had been efficiently quarantined, then banished to the warp with ruthless efficiency. There was no celebration, no voices raised in jubilation. As each new section of the craft world was declared clear, the world ship had been infested, and the most dire consequences would likely follow. It was into this unfolding tragedy that Yvain and her companions arrived. Led by the solitaire from the Webway Gate that Farseer Lathriel had begun to seal once more, they were held at spear point by a shrine of shining spears, 
before being led to the Craft World's Council. The newcomers were Eldar, that much was obvious, but they had with them those who wore the armor of Komora. In the wake of a demon invasion, the Biotani were loath to welcome more potential enemies into their domain. Only when a knot of demonettes sprinted from the shadows of a ruined theater did the fates show their true hand. Lathriel's warriors scythed down the first wave of demon invaders, but the slanishy creatures were fast and hell-bent on reaching Ivrain. Many Beltani fell to slashing talons and gouging blades before the Daughter of Shades stretched out her arms, her body glowing with the power of souls from beyond. She gave a great sigh, great mists pouring from her mouth to wind around every fiend in the great chamber. There came a horrible keening, as if a thousand ghosts gave voice to their anguish at once, and when the mist had cleared, the demons were gone. The resultant parley was strained, but welcome on both sides. Lathriel dimly remembered watching her vein dance during her childhood. She was taken aback to recognize her after the passing of so many cycles, and yet she was unsettling now. Not only in the company she kept, but in her eyes and manner of speech. There was no time to investigate further, however, for the craft world was on the brink of calamity. Under Lathriel's stewardship, Ivrain and her vanguard were hurried to the Dome of Seeing. There, they were to take part in an emergency council. The debate was already raging, with demons defeated. The spirit seers were doing everything in their power to siphon untainted souls from the catastrophically damaged Infinity Circuit and install them into wraith constructs by way of salvation. But they were few, and the demon intruders many. Even as they worked, the race bone skeleton of the craft world was crumbling and turning to grey ash. If this hideous metaphysical transformation continued, the craft world itself would slowly fall apart. Something had to be done. Something drastic. When Ivrain spoke up unheralded, there was a great clamor amongst the great and the good of the craft world. Who was she to return to Beotan unannounced after forsaking their ways? Why did she bring the murderous warriors of the Dark City to their door, claiming to know the truth of their mutual destiny? The Autarchs had little time for Ivrain, no matter her pedigree. When Lathriel spoke in her defense, however, all ears turned to listen. Perhaps, said the Farseer, the returned wanderer was more than she seemed. She had banished the demons of Slaanesh with the same ease that another Eldar might exhale a weary sigh. Perhaps... She was the opener of the Seventh Way, as spoken of in the prophecy by Kaisuduras, the anchorite, nemesis of she who thirsts, who weaves the skeins at the dawn of the Rana Dandra. The hush that fell over the assembled masses as Lathriel's words was intense. The atmosphere held in equal parts hatred, fear, confusion, and hope. Only a few of those present dared to believe that perhaps their dying craft world could travel that thin strand of fate that led to true rebirth. Then came Jane Zar, her blade still dripping with ichor, armored boots clacking on racebone. She strode to the center of the dome and held court in a voice both clear and true. This one speaks with many voices. She is our salvation. Listen well. The Fracture of Biotan Flanked by statues of mythological heroes, and with the Visarch standing silently beside her, Ivrain spoke long and well to the assembled masses. At first her voice seemed that of a wise mother giving stern guidance. As her speech continued and her passion came through, her tone changed to that of a youth caught in the first flush of strength and determination. When challenged by a disbelieving elder, her voice changed once more, to the acid tones of a crone who had no time to suffer fools. Her presence was strong, not in the way that Jane Sar's stoic warrior soul lit a fire in the soul of every elder that saw her, but in the manner of storms to come, cold, close, and with the promise of destruction on the horizon. There was only one way for the Elder of Beeltan to survive the demon curse that the mask had brought upon them, 
be they living or dead, the Biotani risked oblivion anew with every hour that slipped past. But she was emissary of a deity that had never truly been born, yet whose power eclipsed the stars. She could guide them to a new future, if they would allow it. All those present had heard the name that fell from her lips, yet when she spoke it, every Eldar there felt a grave, cold claw of trepidation settle upon their heart. Iniad had awakened. The suzerous of voices that swelled in response to the Ravain's declaration swiftly ebbed away as Janazar stepped forward, her imperious gaze sweeping around the assembly. Ivraine waited until even her most strident detractors had grown silent, then continued. She spoke of the nascent god's power and of revelations to come. The accepted wisdom was that for Inead to manifest fully and defeat Stanish forever, every Eldar in the galaxy had to die, giving the composite god spirit strength enough to prevail. Many nodded in agreement. That was the myth, often recounted. Yet to wait for that final fate meant for the fires of the Eldar race to gutter and die out altogether. That could not be allowed to happen. Ivraim proposed another way, the seventh path, which wound between the darkness and the light. Ivraim relayed the vision she had witnessed in the crucible of Cormora and secret knowledge that had come with it. Inyad sentience would be focused upon five enchanted bones cast across the sovereign domain of the Eldar. These took the form of swords entrusted to the agents of the Eldar gods in eons past. Legend had it that they were carved by the smith god Vor, each fashioned from a finger of the crone goddess Morahig's severed hand. Together, these blades had the power to awaken a god. If wielded in the right hands, they had dominion over life as well as death. At this, Evrain raised Kavir, the Sword of Sorrows, by way of demonstration. Power shone from its elegant edge, both dark and light at the same time. There were four more such blades, said Evrain, two of which were lost amongst the ruins of the Crone Worlds. Should all five be drawn and blooded together, Inead should have a strong enough focus in real space to awaken fully and manifest his potential as the downfall of Slanesh. One of these crone swords, Asuvar, the sword of silent screams, lay within the heart of Craftworld Bealtan itself. It was that blade which Evrain intended to claim, and in doing so, put the ailing Craftworld out of its misery. This time, the uproar that greeted Evrain's proclamation was so clamorous that no word could be made out against another. The exarch, Talarath Shadowheart, darted forward, his biting blade revving, only to be knocked from his feet by the flat of Jaina Zar's polearm. Others started forward, their faces masked of aggression and despair, yet Evrain kept calm. But the Vizarch moved to guard her, power sword held in wordless challenge. The time for words was over. The emissary of Inead closed her eyes, channeled her inner light into the blood-red gauntlet that formed her left hand, and plunged her fist deep into the infected racebone core of the craft world. Breathless moments passed, and there was a thunderous boom as if rain pulled Asuvar from the racebone spine of craft world Bealtan. She drew it forth as if the iron-hard ground were no more solid than a pool of water. Then she held it aloft. Dripping a psychic byproduct, the great blade burned with such fell light it seared the eyes to witness it. Evrain screamed in a mixture of triumph and pain as incredible energy seared through her. She did not let the blade fall, for to do so was to damn her race to a slow extinction. This was a key as much as a sword, one of five such keys that unlocked the last two hope, hidden long ago by the prescient goddess Mora Hig in case the doorway to death itself needed to be flung wide. Underfoot, the craft world shook as if in the throes of an earthquake. High pillars split, cracked along their length, and toppled to crash amidst billowing clouds of dust into the forests below. A million departed souls cried out, released from their bondage in the infinity circuit, where the ravenous demons of Slanish roamed on their gluttonous hunt. The seismic shivers of the world ship intensified, 
becoming an eruption. Arise, cried Ivrain. Arise and live! Something terrible burst from the shattered race bone of the world ship. Swathed in ectoplasm, it was a towering monstrosity of twisted bone and shimmering souls, both terrible and beautiful all at once. The gathered Baltani clutched at their eyes, their hearts, their ears. They staggered and fell, clinging to the rubble of their beloved home, even as it turned black and broke apart before their eyes. Amongst them stood Ivrain, glowing bright as she rose up into the air with a cry of fierce joy. The apparition before her spoke a word of deafening silence, and the void itself shook in response. The Incarn, godly avatar of Inyad, had risen. Chapter 2 Descent into the Past These Inari are a curse upon our fractured race, a mockery of our Eldari forebears. How can we return to those days? Unite behind the false glamour of a lost supremacy, when the follies of that age were so profound they scarred the universe. We have forged a path that leads away from damnation, tried and true. Those that would lead us back at the behest of a fanatic, a mute and a demon are so deluded they should be sent to embrace the macabre shadow god they serve. Millennia, Autark of Bealtan The Guardians on the Threshold The cataclysm that Avrain had brought unto Bealtan was not a sudden shattering like that of a broken crystal, but rather an eruption followed by a rippling spread, like that of a boulder dropped in a lake. By harnessing the death of the Infinity Circuit, the newcomers had brought into being the Incarn, Avatar of Inyad. In doing so, Ivrain had signaled the awakening of the Whispering God, and opened a new path for the entire Eldar race. With so many departed souls concentrated in one place, and his chosen followers gathered as one, Inyad had many of the focal points he needed to manifest his power. Yvain had brought to Bealtan the consciousness that Eldred Ulthran had failed to summon upon Corkiria, though at a high cost. For light years in every direction the warp seized, buckled and raged, a hundred psychic vortices whirling through the stars at once. The Incarn's creation was a violent birth, and it had spread disaster near and far. The race-bone skeleton of Bealtan was already rotting as a result of the demonic invasion, rocked to its foundations by a vein's retrieval of the hidden sword. It was shaken apart. Whole sections of the craft world withered, split and fell away from the central mass like petals falling from a frozen flower. The craft world, originally built from ancient Eldar ships to be an ark of salvation, shed its constituent parts to reveal a living megastructure shuddering in seismic upheaval. The slow but disastrous fragmentation was not confined to the physical realm. With the infinity circuit suddenly flooded with death energy, the demons that invaded it were banished utterly, repelled from its reaches by the sheer trauma of the Incarn's manifestation. The ancestral Eldar souls who had once dwelt in that timeless limbo found themselves stranded on the brink of the abyss, with eternal darkness on one side and the seething hunger of Slaanesh on the other. The upheaval was so profound that many Eldar cast about for revenge. The emotions of the warlike Baltani had always run hot and initial shock soon became open hostility. To some, the cause of the craft world's demise was ascribed to a Cormorite invasion. To others, the spectre that appeared in their midst was tainted by the energies of chaos, perhaps even a demon of Slaanesh in a cruel disguise. Were it not for the power and morbid beauty of the dread being that hovered above her, Ivrain would likely have been slain a dozen times over. Her Cormorite vanguard found itself fighting for its life more than once, but once Ivrain had entrusted the Vizak with the sword of silent screams, none stood against them for long. Pockets of violence broke out wherever confusion outweighed solidarity. The spectre of kinstrife 
was kept from consuming the Biotani only by urgent psychic messages from their farseers. The seers worked harder than ever to save their home and the spirits of their ancestors that dwelt within. All the while, the void above resounded to distant laughter. The craft world was infected. Now the Biotani fought for survival. At Lathriel's command, every elder on the path of the seer took waystones from the spectral gardens and pressed them to stretches of naked waistbone, beckoning the lost spirits of the dead into the safety of the psychoactive gems. Once the transfer was complete, the seers handed them reverently to jet-bike-mounted couriers that bore them swiftly to Beeltan's ghost halls. There the spirits incorporated them into ghost warrior constructs in order to save them. For the race bone shells of the unliving warriors were separate from the infected material of the Infinity Circuit. The Eldar of the proud worldship viewed the creation of such warriors as a kind of necromancy but they had little choice if they wanted to preserve the legacy of their ancestors. The mass installation of stranded spirits into bipedal shells was an act of soul craft on a grand scale. Even as the craft world broke apart, the ghost halls were emptied until thousands of wraith constructs stood upon Beeltan's cracking landscapes. A strange phenomenon occurred wherever Yvrain and her allies passed through the wreckage and ruin, Following the lead of their mistress, blood brides and incubi darted, leapt and vaulted to those sections of the infinity circuit that could not be reached by the seers. They pressed empty waystones to those areas where the willow the wisp revealed the ancient souls clustered within broken wraith bone. Even though they had not the psychic mastery of the spirits here, the lambent lights of departed spirits seemed to flow out of the infinity circuit and pass straight into those waystones. Some of the Beotani that witnessed this act saw it as soul theft and drew their weapons to lay low the warriors they saw as parasites in their midst. In every instance, a harlequin interposed his blade, shaking their heads solemnly by way of warning. These were the Inari, they said, the reborn faithful of Inead, elder so in tune with death the long-dead ancestors would join them willingly. Through it all, the bone singers of Bealtan practiced their uncanny art, some resculpting the race bone of the shrine craft and dome ships that had split away from the craft world. Others raised healing chansons and plain songs that saw the ash black skeletons of Bealtan slowly reform, a cadaverous shadow as its former incarnation, but a mighty world ship nonetheless. It would take decades, if not centuries, for the world ship to be rebuilt. The craft world's solar sails were eaten away, and at its rear, the webway gate flickered and pulsed as if in pain. Warp storms raged in a vast corona around the craft world as a psychic shockwave of the Incarn's birth bled out into the universe. Yvain felt uncertainty settle upon her for the first time in months, her absolute faith wavering. With the fabric of the material realm torn to shreds around the Inari, there would be no escape from the ailing craft world, be it through the real space or the labyrinth dimension. It was no agent of Beotan that saved them from the doldrums of stasis, nor even that of Inyad, but those of Ulthway, craft world of the damned. The ripples of Inyad's awakening spread throughout the cosmos. For those with the witch sight, it was a discoloration of the sky that was impossible to ignore. Even the humblest soothsayers saw deathly omens. Across the galaxy, scattered bones fell in the shape of Inead's crosspiece and crucible rune. Eyes glowed with white fire in prophetic dreams, and jagged crone's claws shimmered in bloody scrying bowls. For the expert psychers of the Eldar race, the effect was far starker. Many were seized with waking nightmares, crying out in fear and clutching their hearts, as visions of a deathly revenant burned in their mind's eye. The infinity circuit of every craft world besides Bealtan glowed white-hot with flaring anticipation. Each world ship lit brightly and given a burst of acceleration by this spiritual renaissance. The Eldar people looked to their seers for explanation. 
Those who had mastered the psychic wave of fear and hope led their people in meditation on the nature of this twist in the schemes of fate. Everywhere the seers cast their minds, the tapestries of fate were unravelling and taking new shape. Every stand of causality led ultimately to the darkness of the Rana Dandra, just as they had since the birth of the great enemy. But that darkness, it seemed, was far more distant than before. The Seer Council of Craftworld Earthway were the most skilled of all their kind. They saw clearly the revelation that Evrain had engineered upon Bealtan. The most senior of their number, Eldred Ulthran, demanded that Evrain and her reborn kin be brought to Ulthway as swiftly as possible. In public, the rest of the Seer Council agreed his reasoning was sound. In private, when the higher Farseer was deep in his meditations, they made subtle inferences that Eldred had overstepped his bounds and their agendas were no longer the same. The elders of Ulthway conducted a great runic ritual at Eldred's behest, using the spirit link between the crystal seers that populated the Great Dome and those of Bealtan's recently devastated equivalent. The ritual was a gamble, despite the fact the hyperspatial link was strong between the two craft worlds. Though the warp storms that raged near Ulthway and Bealtan could theoretically be psychically channeled into a tunnel leading through the warp from one craft world to the other, the process might well consume the souls of the travellers of walked it, and those that had conducted the ritual too. To use the crystal seers as conduits for psychic energy instead of revering them as honoured ancestors was a gross breach of craft world culture. It was considered even worse than taking a spirit into a waystone and transferring it to a race construct. The Farseers that had undergone their kind's peculiar transformation into Psycho Crystal before later joining with their Craftworld's Infinity Circuit had earned their rest a dozen times over. To break the departed Seers from that connection and to use them as a mere tool for sorcery was a heinous crime indeed but one Eldred Othran had already committed through his Harlequin proxies on every craft world across the galaxy. Such was the urgency of the hour that the Farseer showed no compunction doing so again. The Seers gambled much if the ritual went awry. In theory, a single lapse of concentration could see the portal open a tunnel into the Empyrean itself, allowing a demon incursion to spill into Othway, just as it had into Bealtarn. If the seers of Althway had not been confident in their psychic supremacy and had the mental might to back that confidence up, they may well have capsized the entire world ship into the warp. As it was, their skills proved equal to the task. With Eldred Othran leading the runic rite, an unstable warp portal opened up under Althway's dome of crystal seers. Uncounted light years away, Evrain walked as if in a daze to the shattered equivalent upon Bealtan. What she found in that dome was all but invisible to the naked eye, but the Incarn was drawn towards it as driftwood is drawn to a whirlpool. The Reborn, for that was the name Evrain's followers had adopted for themselves, passed through the warp portal and vanished from Bealtan altogether. The howling, screaming vortex through which the Reborn passed was the embodiment of utter chaos. So fierce and baleful was this passageway, it would have robbed the sanity of a lesser being in a matter of moments. Yet the reborn found themselves floating through a tunnel in the warp unhindered, as if borne by an underwater current. At their fore was the Incarn, a revenant creature so inimical to chaos that the stuff of the Imperium would not slow it. Even the gods of chaos did not look upon the creature directly. The incarnation of Inead's essence was so anathema to them that they could not truly perceive it, even had they known where to look. The ripples of the Avatar's passing flowed outwards nonetheless, causing a great ruction in the warp. The bow wave of its translocation cast Imperial ships aside hundreds of light years away, ripping open gala fields and distorting the light of the Astronomicon. Thousands of human lives were lost with every second of the Reborn's passage, it was a price the Elder would gladly pay a million times over if it gave them even the slightest chance of turning the tables upon their nemesis, Sanesh. 
With rain came her Cormorite allies, but also a detachment of warriors from Bealtarn. Even as the craft world fell apart around her, there had been those who had believed her claims of rejuvenation and salvation. Across every stratum of elder society, there were those who had thrown in their lot with Inia's disciples, declaring themselves reborn. Four monks amongst those converted to Ivrain's cause were dire avengers from the Silver Blade, the shrine in which the Vizarch, in his former life, had taught Ivrain the path of the warrior. Near three score of the tall crested warriors had forsaken their traditional colors and, with a few simple minutes of concentration, altered the psychically attuned metafabrics of their aspect armor until it bore the same coloration as Evrain's regal panoply and the deep scarlet plate of the Vizarch at her side. The dire avengers were far from alone. Beotown was once a highly populated craft world, and the appearance of the God of the Dead's avatar had been a compelling sign that Evrain spoke the truth about a new order. With the dire avengers came warriors from every aspect, guardian citizens in the garb of the craft world's militia, whole squadrons of grav tank pilots, and rank upon rank of silent ghost warriors. These wraith like converts had been given a chance to truly live again, for their transfer from Bileton's shattered infinity circuit had been more complete than any spirit seer or waystone could ever achieve. Yvain did not disappoint her new followers. All those who had joined the Anari cause had heard her speak about the hope she brought to their race, and many influential Biltani were soon devoted to it, body and soul. For too long the Elder, be they Craftworlder, Exodite, Harlequin, Outcast or Cormorite, had skulked in the darkness, afraid to burn too brightly lest they catch the attention of she who thirsts. To have a force amongst them that could take the fight back to Stanish, even one as disturbing as the Incarn, was freeing, a call to action that no Eldari had felt for ten thousand years. Trail of the Seers The tunnel through reality, known as the Bridge of Stars, yawned, spasmed, and pulsed. Through that secret aperture came the Inari, the favorite of Inead. The combination of the Seer Council's runic powers and the powerful psyche of the Incarn had brought the reborn safely to the crystal havens of Ulthway. One step closer to securing the two lost crone swords that have reigned sought from the husk of the Eldar Empire. Though the manner of their coming had cost the lives of several far seers and driven some of the Anari half mad with fear, the stillness that descended upon the dome of crystal seers after their safe passage was a balm to the soul. First to emerge was the Incarn, hissing and whispering in the voices of the dead. The Elthwayan Council felt the cold mantle of terror upon them at the sight. The creature came forward like a ghost, slow and ethereal, the energies of the other world swirling around it. It was slender and androgynous, yet far larger and more fearsome than any Eldar warrior, save perhaps the avatar of the bloody-handed god. With the living statue of Kaela Mencha was a creature of fire, iron, and blood. The Incarn manifested a shuddering chill that was both invigorating and shocking, like a deluge of ice water. In the Revenant's wake came Ivrain and the Vizarch, leading the reborn to gather beneath crystal stairways. The crested helms of the Althway seers turned to look down at the newcomers with the unwavering gaze of raptors. There was an electrifying tension, a sense of history in the making. To the reef of all those nearby, the Incarn drifted from the dome's heart and circulated around the periphery, staring at each of the crystal seers in turn as if hunting for something. It was Evrain who spoke first, formally thanking the seers of Craftworld Ulthway for their aid. To cross the galaxy in a matter of hours was a feat worthy of the Eldari at the apex of their power. It was a status they could achieve once more, now that Inead had shown them the seventh way, the path between darkness and light. First, though, they had to ensure the physical conduits of the God of the Dead were brought together. The Chrome Swords, when united, could act as a focal point for Inead's ascension, thereby restoring the broken cycle of life and death. 
The Vizark claimed that two of these blades were buried in the heart of the Eldar's former empire. They were somewhere upon the Chrome world known as Belial IV, caught between real space and the warp in the Eye of Terror. With Ulthway having kept vigil over that vast tempest for so long, they were the logical choice of allies. Eldred nodded quietly in satisfaction as the openers of the Seventh Way made their case. You ask the impossible, sneered Yemshon Ilfoyle of the Seer Council, shaking his head before putting on his ghost helm. Pray be still, daughter of shades, and keep your people in silence. Your presence is desired, of course, but we have matters of the past to attend to before we consider the future. There is no matter of more import than this, said Eldred Orthron, his tone grave. I have foreseen it. You have foreseen much, answered one of his peers, Alariel Coppermain, donning her own helm with ceremonial formality. And yet, ultimately it seems you are blind. I see further than all others and act accordingly, said Eldred indignantly, which is why our kindred now stand here, on the threshold of a lasting victory over she who thirsts. An impressive claim, said Yemshon inclining his helmeted head. But a victory at what cost? The destruction of Craftwell Biltan? The loss of thousands of Eldar ancestors? The dissolution of Harmony itself? There will always be those whose vision is clouded by fear, said Eldred. Now we proceed. Muster the Black Guard. No, said Arley. The word resounded through the dome of crystal seers like a dropped tombstone. Eldred Ulthran, said Hijarok, the blind from the crystal stairs opposite. We, the Seer Council of Ulthaness Shellway, accuse you of misappropriation of our mutual destiny. In conjunction with the Midnight Sorrow, who exist outside our cultural jurisdiction, you engaged in the theft of the crystal seers. At this, Hidrock motioned towards a stairway step, where the lack of a fossilized farseer was like a missing tile in a sacred mosaic. After taking the remains of these long-serving heroes, you formed a hyperspatial link with the crystal sands of Cochiria, thereby endangering every departed Eldar soul in every craft world. The death blow to Slanesh was leveled and never dealt, protested Eldred. Were it not for the intervention of the crass warriors of humanity. And yet they did intervene. And your ritual fell apart like Cain's castle of bone, said Yemshon, risking billions of souls, and all but handing she who thirsts a chance to consume every craft worlder that has died since the fall. In seeking to keep the Rana Dendron at bay, said Hedgerock the Blind, you may have hastened its onset. Your behavior is intolerable, said Arane. It is not for you to decide the fate of our race by yourself, nor to dabble in the affairs of gods. You are no god, Eldred Ulthran. You are barely even an elder, for you should have joined the ranks of your crystal brethren long ago. Your time has long passed. It is the will of the Seer Council that you be exiled to the void. At this, Eldred stumbled as if he had been struck. Act once more on the behalf of the Eldar race, said Yemshon, and you will be put to death. The judgment of the Seer Council saw Eldred stump to the floor. His grandeur evaporated in the heat of their ire. Every one of his ten thousand years and more weighed heavy upon him, and his bones, already half crystal, felt like jagged knives within his sparse frame. To have his influence over the fate of his race eradicated was worse than death to the ancient Farseer, for he had striven for nothing else since the fall. Evraine spoke eloquently in Eldred's defense, only to find herself verbally attacked in turn. Who was she to demand the Seer Council lend her aid and to request they follow her lead into the stronghold of the great enemy? By her direct action, Orthway's martial ally, the ancient and proud craft world Biltan, had been reduced to a skeleton shadow upon the brink of extinction. 
What was to prevent the same fate from happening to Ulthway? Was it not enough that they stood sentinel over the Eye of Terror, thwarting the chaos-tainted armies that emerged from within it, and sending their citizen soldiers against the worst terrors in the universe? Many of Rain's Bealtarn followers reacted strongly to the hostility of Ulthway's seers. They held forth with great passion, saying that though their craft world had indeed suffered after the apotheosis of the Incarn, and though they could never truly forgive her, they truly believed the damage could be healed. More importantly, there was a greater battle being fought, worth more than life itself. With a way to escape Salanish's curse, there was a slim chance that Bealtan might succeed in its quest to restore the former glory of the Eldar. It was a crusade once seen as futile by many of the Bealtani present, but admitted to by none amongst them, for to do so was unthinkable stigma within their militant culture. Now there was a real hope of success. The argument was persuasive, but many Eldar seers remained unconvinced. When asked by the Ulthway Farseers if they spoke on behalf of their craft world, or as a rogue spent a faction, the Beotani reborn had no answer. That in itself was telling enough. On and on the debate raged. The usual allusions to well-trodden myths and social moors gave way to veiled insults and outright displays of anger. The Ulthway Seer Council believed that Eldred, Evrain, and their fellow revolutionaries represented the worst of all disruptive influences. Though they had re-knitted the skein of the possible futures, they had done so at so great a cost, and in so reckless a manner, they could not be trusted. It was during this scathing assessment that Jemshon Ilfoyer suddenly paused mid-rhetoric, the heat of his anger still radiating as he glanced sharply at his fellow elders. A psychic impulse passed through the ranks of the Seer Council. In that moment, the urgency of the missive bringing the debate to a pause. Word had arrived of yet more visitors to Orthway via the Webway Gate at the World Ship's rear. A delegation from another craft world had arrived. A diplomatic corps were already inbound, making for the Dome of Crystal Seers with all haste. When the tall-helmed warriors made their way into the Dome and approached the impromptu war council that raged there, a smile came once more to Eldred Othran's features. These mysterious warriors were clad in the colors of the fabled craft world, Altansar. Within craft world society, the Elder of Altansar had long dwelt in the twilight of mistrust. Much speculation surrounded them. They spoke only in whispers and never removed their homes, no matter the situation. During the calamitous times of the fall, Altansar was on the periphery of the Eye of Terror, the cosmic wound resultant from Stanish's birth. At first, the population believed themselves safe, but the gravitic pull of the immense warp storm gradually drew the craft world and its attendant ships into its reaches over the course of five hundred years. The only Eldar to escape Altansar's doom was the Phoenix Lord Morgan Ra, first of the Dark Reapers. Towards the end of the 41st millennium, that legendary warrior sought his craft world in the depths of the Eye of Terror. After a grueling series of trials, he managed to locate Altansar and guide it through the insanity of that etheric tempest. It re-emerged through the Cadian Gate, bringing the Altansari into the material dimension once more after their impossibly long incarceration. Since that day, the Altansar Eldar have used the symbol of the broken chain to represent their craft world. Set free from their eternal bondage, they had fought tirelessly against the forces of she who thirsts. Yet despite their proven loyalty to the Eldar cause, the matter of how the Antalsari survived their millennial imprisonment in the dark heart of chaos has proved persistent. The Altansari are unwelcome on many craft worlds, even forbidden, amid fears that they are not as closely aligned to craft world culture as they claim, and secretly serve Slanesh, despite the evidence to the contrary. The question is asked time and again, 
Have they not been tainted by their ordeal, changed by the ruinous powers that roam the eye at will? Usually such questions are put aside, but with the appearance of an Altansar delegation at this critical time upon Ulthway, they arose in greater measure than ever before. A furore broke out almost immediately. To add fuel to the fires of controversy, the Altansari were moving to side with Vrain. It was the warlock Gwentilian Onyxblade who stepped forward to represent Altansar. Her low whisper was unheard at first amongst the raised voices of the Ulthway seers, but when she reached up and unclasped her helm with a dual puff of escaping air, the dome's interior fell silent once more. Only the Incarn could be heard, its unnerving hiss turning from the sibilance of a questing serpent to something like a sigh of relief. Tall even for an elder, Gwentilian was a striking sight. Her skin was so pale and waxen, it was as if she had died long ago. Many of those gathered could not shake the notion they were looking at a well-preserved corpse. The warlock held her long, black witchblade as if it were a rod of office, proof that though she was one of a forgotten kindred, she walked the path. At her side was one of the rare feline creatures known as a gyrinx, those psychic familiars that bolstered the mental and spiritual power of those they took as masters. The dome's atmosphere grew thick as the warlock climbed atop a nearby spiral of crystal stairs to speak. Otakarensia extended you welcome after all then, said Yemshon, nodding in agreement. The gates of Asujan's halls open and cleanse those who enter. There are those who call Oswey damned, interjected Zurelias the wise, addressing his fellow council members. Purely for our proximity to the eye, would we be the worst kind of hypocrites if we were to refuse those of Altanasar for the same reason? And we thank you for it, said Gwentilian, disturbingly. Her soft whisper was echoed by every one of her kindred. You came to speak in defense of Eldred Ulthorn and the Yenari, said Yemshon. Have you a vested interest in this matter? We must return to the Eye, said the Altansar warlock, her gyring prowling around her legs. The blade that the daughter of Shade speaks of must be reclaimed from our enemies if our race is to transcend. I know in which city it lies. We failed once and only escaped she who thirsts, thanks to the shroud Yeneard cast over us. We cannot fail again. At her words, many of the Antalsari shifted uncomfortably, looking through the translucent dome walls of the Eye of Terra's purple bruise amongst the stars. I cannot ask my people to return to the Eye, said Gwentilian, but neither can I stand idle. So I give my soul to Ivrain and to Inyad himself. Raising her sword, she slashed her own throat wide open, Black blood spurted outwards as she grasped her last. Irain darted forward, grabbing Gwentilian's body. The Anari priestess seemed to inhale deeply even as the warlock's body stumped lifeless and pale. A moment later, the gyrinx, purring in recognition, rubbed itself against Irain's legs. And so we must act, said Irain, staring unfocused into the middle distance. We must leave now to retrieve the crone swords of Bala Isle Four lest the handmaidens of Slanesh reach it first. Surely the risk of snuffing out this flicker of hope is too great, replied Yemshon. He twitched a finger, and a tree of Orthway warlocks drew their own witch blades. We cannot allow you to take the fate of so many into your hands. The wise do not pin their hopes upon a life unborn. Would this journey not be better made by the warriors of Craftworld Ilkase? They profess to know the Chrome Worlds better than any other. None know the Eye as well as the Altansari, said Vrain. They have navigated its tides for thousands of years, avoiding the claws of the demon with each new day. Quintilian's sacrifice will not be in vain. There were whispers of assent from the Altansari behind her, building a hissing chorus. No, said Yemshon. He raised his arms, and ethereal winds raced around the dome, knocking several of the Altansari Eldar from their feet. 
You and your followers will stay until the Seer Council decide your fate. The psychic hurricane blew harder still, and the craft world erupted into utter bedlam. Courtly negotiations turned to veiled threats, then to open hostility, as Ulthway psychers threw up barriers of psychic force and sent strength-sapping curses into the ranks of the Inari. The Vizark fought through the psychic tempest, his blade raised as he made for Yemshon. Then Khan loomed from the shadows, a storm of glittering spirits whirling around it as it bore down on the chanting seers. Then a clarion shout rang out. The harlequins of the Midnight Sorrow stepped out one by one from behind the darkest of the crystal statues, each striking a pose as if parrying a blow. With them was an elderly farseer clad in a simple black robe. The seer council locked on in wonder. The newcomer was Kasuadras, the anchorite, wisest of all Ulthway's visionaries. He had emerged from his self-imposed imprisonment to speak to his people. The psychic hurricane that raged around the dome ebbed away, becalmed in an instant as Kasuadras raised his staff above his head. He spoke in a croaking baritone, a voice that had clearly not been used for decades, but yet carried immense weight. They stood at the crux point of fate, he said. Whether the seers wished it or not, the Inari had to leave, or else another craft world would die, never to be reborn. As one, the seer council turned away. The Inari, their ranks now bolstered not only by the Beotani, but also by a few bold Altansari, the Harlequins of the Midnight Sorrow, and a swathe of Ulthway sympathizers, made for the dome's primary gates. With them went the Incarn, the ground crackling with hoarfrost at its passage. Eldred Ulthran followed the creature, bent under the weight of his peer's censure. Kaisudaras, using his staff as a support, went with him. Before the craft world's diurnal cycle ended, the Inari had left for the Eye of Terror. They emerged upon a journey of supreme peril, for their journey was to Slaanesh's own birthplace. Not one of them looked back. Empire of Ash The journey into the depths of the Eye of Terror was fraught. The purplish swirl of that vast warp storm had the presence of a living predatory thing. The weight and saturation of its evil pulled at the soul as a black hole devours light. Without the thought of Inyad's ascension to inspire an icy determination in the Ulthway pilots carrying the Inari into the eye, those at the helm would likely have turned back a dozen times over. On they went, each soul resolved to live as boldly and fully as the ancient Eldari, rather than to look away or hide in the manner of their modern kin. The graceful starship moved under the cover of gigantic hollow fields, bypassing the embattled war zones of the Cadian Gate and venturing into the unstable overlap between real space and the warp. The Eldar expedition evaded fang-toothed tornadoes, fled from hungry ghost suns, rode out hailstorms of bloody skulls, and negotiated crashing tsunamis of raw warp energy. They did not falter. Whenever the resolve of the Inari began to waver in the face of these trials, Evrain was there to inspire them and lead them on. It was this bravery that came to typify the Inari over the months to come, securing their reputation as a force for change from one side of the galaxy to the other. Already, the shock waves the Inari had sent through the Eldar civilizations was causing ripples of causality in their turn. The transformation of Evrain in the Crucibal had triggered the invasion and destruction of Cormora, and Asdubal Vect himself had abandoned the Dark City as a result. Though the damage to his reign had been cataclysmic, the Supreme Overlord had already set in motion hundreds of plots and schemes that would reaffirm his stranglehold upon Dark Eldar society. It was the metaphysical danger of the Inari's rise that concerned Vect most of all. Almost as soon as Evrain had escaped the Dark City, wheels had been put in motion that had seen a host of Vect's homunculi allies depart for the most dangerous reaches of the webway, and from there, 
to the same demon-haunted planet sought by the reborn. In many ways, it was a dark homecoming. Among the coven's founders were the self-same elder, whose wanton indulgence had led to the fall. After a series of maddening and surreal trials, the Inari expedition reached its destination with most of their number still alive. There were those that maintained it was the spirit of Gwentilian guiding the Inari through the Eye of Terror's hellish reaches that allowed them to reach their destination all but intact. Others said it was the presence of the Incarn. It may even have been Inead himself that held back the infernal tides. Certainly, that was what Ivrain had claimed since they had passed the Cadian Gate. Belial IV The chrome world of Belial IV was once at the heart of the Eldar Empire. A planet so vast, its gravity once sent comets hurtling through space around it like stones flung from a sling. Belial IV seemed tumultuous from a distance, but was prosperous beyond measure upon its surface. Within its luxurious and beautiful cities, every possible kind of indulgence was pursued. For millennia, it thrived at the golden center of a web of influence that quenched suns and forged stars at will. When the Cataclysm of Silenish's birth ripped the Eldar civilization apart, Belial IV was transformed from paradise to purgatory. It became a blasted wasteland of haunted ruins, demon-infested caves, and scattered riches left to tarnish under the weight of eons. To this day, waystones are scattered across its wastes, each a treasure beyond price. Though many of the reborn were slain during demonic attacks, or driven irrevocably insane en route, the core of the Inari's expedition was still intact when the convoy of starships came into orbit around the giant milky-white orb of Belial IV. When Othway war hosts grav tanks bore the Inari low into the chrome world's atmosphere, and from there to the surface of the planet, there was not a soul to be seen. Dunes of off-white dust had accumulated everywhere, the residue of a once mighty civilization mingled with the remains of its people. The planet's ruined dotted surface had the stale and unwelcome atmosphere of a place that had not felt the footfall of a living creature for hundreds of years. Just occasionally, however, the Inari saw flickers of movement in their peripheral vision, as if something half-real was watching. As the Othwayan contingent split off in a spiraling search pattern, the Harlequins of the Midnight Sorrow too fanned out, making exaggerated gestures of stealth. So swift was their progress, that many Yunari asked themselves if they had visited those ill-fated lands before. It was their shadow seer that brought their suspicions to a vein first, drawing a thin and shimmering veil of darkness behind her as she came. They were not alone amongst the ruins. The creatures that pursued them were not ghosts, not demons, but creatures very much flesh and blood. No sooner had the shadow seer confided in a vein, then a howling menagerie of abhorrent terrors charged headlong from the ruins ahead. They were coming straight for the Inari, hungry and focused on their prey, despite the Harlequin Psyche's illusionary veils. At their four were eyeless ergools, multiple nostrils twitching as they bounded on all fours towards their prey. Behind the creatures came all manner of twisted anatomies, from muscle-bound hulks whose spines bristled with steroid injectors, to whip-limbed hunchbacks, who scuttled on bare feet with the speed of hunting spiders. Floating amongst them was a monkey sent on a mission of murder by the flesh master, Yurian Rakarth. Eyes wide, the monkey grinned like flayed skulls as they came, many licking their lips in anticipation of the gruesome experiments they would enact upon the Inari. It was as if the vilest elements of Elderized society had been resurrected amongst their shattered holdings and given forms that better mirrored their inner personas. Not those of elegant and athletic paragons, but those of ravening monsters, whose surpassing ugliness revealed the parasitic souls beneath. The Inari were under attack from the hidden architects of the Four, an echo of the torrid past come to rip away the brightest hope for the future. 
as a silver moon glimmered upon the parched surface of Bilal IV, the echoes of Eldari long dead flitted and moaned amongst the ruins, crying out as the darkest incarnation of their ancient society fell upon their would-be saviors. Even the blood brides and incubi amongst the Yanari ranks were under no illusions as to what their Cormorite brethren intended for them, and so dived into the fray alongside the black guardians of Ulthway and the harquins of the Midnight Sorrow. The razored blades of mercenary and gladiatrix cut away heavily thewed limbs, bisecting leaping ergols and decapitating masked monstrosities wherever they came forward. Incredibly, many of the homunculized minions kept fighting even after sustaining grievous wounds, limbs stumps spraying nameless fluids as they thrashed and flailed. Their violence was indiscriminate, but the unnatural strength behind it made it dangerous. Many a Yanari was hurled, broken across the wasteland to skid like a rag doll into the drifts of bluish-white dust. In the center of it all, a clutch of Talos pain engines drifted towards Yvelaine, claws and tentacles twitching. The shuriken catapults of the Biotani, dire avengers, slashed a hundred wounds into the freshly war machines, black liquid flying from their iron-hard carapaces. The pulsing energies of nearby Kronos parasite engines spurred them on regardless. A double rank of wraith blades loped through the dust to intercept them before they reached Ivrain, elegant ghost swords gleaming as they sliced and cut. The spirit constructs fought with courage and strength, but the pain engines were true masterpieces of the flesh crafter's art. One by one, the wraith blades were caught by cracking claws and wrenched apart. Suddenly, the Vizark was there. Stepping nimbly around the pain engines as he ducked, slashed and moved away once more, avoiding whirling chain frails and jabbing I-Core injectors with impressive grace. Soon, all that was left were hovering carapaces that drizzled foul blood. The eldest of the homunculi, his mouth twisted in a mew of irritation at the sight of his pets being dismembered, brought forth a rune-engraved box from his robes and opened it. Sickly light flooded out, as captive jinn spirits shrieked towards the Vizark. His long blade whirled and slashed, but no physical foes were these, and they could not be cut. They lifted him bodily into the air and stretched his limbs taut. Grinding and snapping sounds were clearly audible as the warrior was slowly stretched to breaking point. A moment before the Vizark came apart, the income burst from the morass of the dead pain engines with a deafening roar of triumph. With nothing more than its bare hands, the Avatar ripped the jinn spirits to dissipating wisps of ectoplasm. It flexed a slender claw, and the jinn's homunculus master withered away to a puff of dust. In far Cormora, those samples of the Covenor's anatomy that were kept for regrowth turned to dust at the same instant. There could be no proof nor safeguard against the death brought by the Incarn, for it was the god of the dead given form. Seeing their comrade's demise, and fearing that he had died a true death at the hands of a demon, the rest of the homunculi withdrew. No prize was valuable enough to risk their carefully maintained and treasured immortality. Within minutes, they were gone entirely, their servants vanishing with them. The Inari had barely regrouped amongst the ruins when a ululating shriek pierced the air. The Soul Hunt of Belial IV The screams in the middle distance were painful to hear. They were not shrieks of agony, but of savage joy. The cries of lunatic killers on the hunt. They were not of mortals, not even the playthings of the homunculi, but entities born from the warp and attracted to the psychic spore of carnage. Every one of the Yanari that heard them felt trepidation. These were the demons of Slanesh, birthed from the catastrophe that had laid their wretched place low. To fall into their clutches here was to know an eternity of torment, and to be consumed utterly by she who thirsts. They told themselves that their souls would be saved from the direst of fates by Evrain and their fellow Yanari, but ancestral fear still clutched at their hearts. Darting up to elevated positions, Yvrain's blood-bright handmaidens peered into the gloom. 
Through the ivory mist came whole armies of blade-wielded chariots, striking sparks from the tumbled ruins as they came. In their wake was a tide of sprinting demonettes. Realization broke across the Eldar like a cold wind. This was a hunt, and they were the quarry. Evrain cursed loud and long. The sword she kept safe within her aided her in finding signs of the ancient swords she sought. One of the artifacts was near, but not likely near enough. Shortly before the homunculus ambush was sprung, Evrain had found a trail of dead waystones, the psycho-crystal gems known as Isha's Tears, highly prized as havens from Sanesh's unquenchable thirst. They were formed by the shearing of real space on the warp during the fall. The particular waystone Evrain had found did not glitter with psychic potential, like those typically sought out by the rangers and wraith knights of the craft world. Instead, they exuded a leaden absence of life. Evrain had followed the trail of dead stones to find it converging with another, then another. It was a sign, a hint that one of the morbid artifacts she sought was close. Though with the demons of Slanesh hunting her, there was no time to investigate. It occurred to her that might be precisely why the demons had chosen this time to strike, though it was just as likely they had waited for the homunculi and the Inari to bleed each other white before attacking the survivors. With her inherited guiding scrowling at her heels, Evrain took up her own crone sword once more and made for the charging demon host. She was unsurprised to see the Vizark leading the Eldar from the front, darting through the densest ruins so the chariots of the Slanesh could not attack him without dashing themselves to pieces. Their Ulfway allies were no more than a few miles distant, though they had split off from Evrain's vanguard in a search pattern in order to find the crone sword they sought. Eldred Othran had insisted there would be a strike force close to the Yanari at all times in case of ambush. As she saw the chariots racing pell-mell around their flanks, Evrain's hope that they could reach their Ulthway's allies ebbed away. The Slaneshi were moving along what had once been the widest boulevards of the crone world's capital city, bouncing and skidding a breakneck pace as they encircled their prey entirely. With them came demonettes riding long-necked, bipedal steeds and freakish, scorpion-tailed fiends whose pincers clacked a percussive accompaniment to a chorus of delighted screams. Within minutes, the Yanari were trapped. They had been expertly driven into a dead end, a sinkhole pit before them and slanishy demons on all sides. Evrain and her vanguard exchanged doleful glances, preparing for a last stand. As they drew close, they saw the sinkhole before them was no natural well at all, but a vast gullet that pulsed and growled in hunger. The hordes of demonettes came within range of the Yanari's shuriken weaponry, and a blizzard of razor discs hurtled out. Their slicing kiss only served to drive the slanishy hunters further into an ecstatic frenzy. On the lithe demons came hissing and hungry. Bounding lightly through the ruins came the harlequins of the Midnight Sorrow, diving and somersaulting to intercept. They joined in battle with the demons with such grace and speed the skirmish seemed as if it were choreographed. The clash between demon and harlequin had long been a subject of their dances. Where the Eldar fell in greatest number, there was Evrain, drawing the souls of the lost into herself even as their bodies died. The ghosts were made visible by the eerie half-reality of the Eye of Terror, to those around her, it seemed that Evrain was physically breathing them in. With each release of deathly energies, the Inari around her found themselves inexplicably invigorated. They pressed the attack with such quick silver speed, even the demonettes looked sluggish by comparison. As a battle reached crescendo, a moan of longing came from the throat of every demonette, steed and fiend. From the gullet pit, blocking the Eldar's path, emerged a vast claw-tipped tongue, as large as a hive transmotive. Many Anari screamed at the sight, fearing she who thirsts herself was emerging to gorge upon them, and perhaps they were right. Riding upon this gruesome appendage, their claws hooked into cairn-sized taste buds were three greater demons of Slanesh. The largest of them, the incarnation of the dark bliss known as the Queen of Suffering, howled with ecstasy, 
as the titanic tongue slashed down, crushing hundreds of elder to death. Flanked by two of its disturbingly alluring kin, the Keeper of Secrets swept a jewel-studded claw through the air, backhanding two leaping harlequins into the scissoring pincers of its fellows. The end was swift, at least. Blood glittered like ruby rain as they came bodily apart. From nowhere, the Incarn loomed upwards through the mist, its hissing whisper growing to a waterfall's roar. It darted towards the greater demons with blurring swiftness and grabbed the Queen of Suffering by the throat. The she-demon gave a strangled cry of surprise as the Incarn ripped open her neck in a welter of blood. But in coming within the arm's reach, the Avatar of Iniad had risked much. A jagged pincer caught the Incarn by the ankle, then another, and another of the Queen's courtiers closed in. The Incarn was yanked down and dashed to the floor. A moment later, it was slammed into the saliva-sodden earth by a flurry of cloven hooves. Ivraine gave a cry of anguish. She summoned the energies of her guard, a storm of whispers hissing out to consume the demoness around her. They turned to cold grey statues, then fell apart, but there were more to take their place. Nearby, Elder Orthron and Cassudras were striking at the flanks of one of the Keepers of Secrets, their witch weapons flaring as they tore at one grievous wound after another. Harlequins vaulted around them, flip belts keeping them one step ahead. The spectacle was so rich in splendor, so steep in ancestral hatred, it was all the Harlequins could do not to fall into their ritual roles and reenact their famed performance of the fall in reality. Even as she fought for her life, Evraine had a strong feeling that she had seen this all before. At first, she could not place where. The rescued souls within her did not number any Harlequins, for the Laughing God took them unto himself instead. Then it came to her. This dance of Harlequin and Slaneshi demon was an echo of the final act, as portrayed by the Midnight Sorrow in the theatres of Komara. Inspiration stuck Ivraine. She knew this performance well, as she had danced a similar waltz in her youth. She dived rolled and span, for by recalling the dance forms that had fascinated her as a child, she found she could predict the Harlequin's battle dance all but perfectly, and therefore that of the demonettes that faced them. On she danced, vaulting and somersaulting, following the scatterings of dead waystones to a nexus of the crystal ovals only a few dozen feet from the greater demons of Sinesh, rampaging through the Yanari lines. Underfoot, she could feel the pulsing energy of one of the swords they had come to claim, a reservoir of deathly power so strong it had stolen even the potential life from the waystones nearby. Smiling grimly, she placed both hands upon the ground and cried out. A heartbeat later, the Incarn burst like a phoenix from the ground beneath the Queen of Suffering, reborn in a fountain of ice-blue energies. It held a long and shining crone sword in both hands, and as it soared into the sky, it cut the demon queen in half from groin to neck. The deathly energies around it lent its speed. In a blur of purplish-white motion, it hacked and slashed at the greater demons until they had discorporated altogether. The weapon wielded by the Avatar, Iniad, was Kirith Zar, the Sword of Souls, largest and most powerful of the Crone Swords. After millennia of slumber, its edge was hungry for the blood of the Eldar's persecutors. Like a bladed whirlwind, the Incarn plunged into the Sinishu Horde. Its every breath was a killing mist, its every thrust the final death of a shrieking demon. The Incarn slashed at the great claw tongue grasping for it, and the hideous appendage withdrew back into its sinkhole lair, as if stung by a greater Murek wasp itself. Inspired by the final act made real, the Harlequins renewed their attack, and within minutes the encircling horde was in utter disarray. Better still, through the ruins could be seen the colours of Othway. With the trap broken, salvation was at hand. Chapter 3 The Last Hope of the Elder the reborn are the only hope left to our people. They seek to unite the Elder Eye entire, to bring together not only the craft worlders, but every scattered shard of our race, be the outcast, exodite, or soul hungry Dukari. With the whispering gods net gathering us together away from the sight of the evil, 
We shall be reforged. We shall be a people that look forward in hope, not backwards in despair. Follow them. Cast aside your waystone and the crippling fear it represents, and we shall soar on the wind of fate once more. Lathria, High Farthia of Bealtan. Light in the Darkness. With the Anari and their Ulthway allies fighting together as one, the Eldar tore apart the tightening noose the Slanishi demons had cast around them. Their strike forces flowed like fast-running streams through the ruins and dust dunes of the shattered Eldari city, capitalizing on their gains before the demon hosts could cut them off. Irene led the charge, her regalia billowing behind her in the ethereal winds as she sprinted through shattered arches and under statues of fallen heroes. Towards the great memorial hall of Atransis, she ran, a vast museum-like structure where the works of the pre-fall elder were once displayed as the foremost treasures of the universe. With Ulthway's close assault specialists forming a wall of blades on either flank, the Inari vanguard plunged into the enormous hall, seeking a defensible position from which they could repel the soul hunt from a narrow frontage. Within those walls, they were to find far more than simple advantage. As the Reborn took up positions on the sweeping ramps and daises of the hall's interior, the building was gradually flooded with golden yellow light. Two immense structures at the back of the hall shook dust from their slab-like fascias as they opened unfurling jerkily like the wings of a butterfly fresh from its chrysalis. A glowing yellow rune portal was revealed within, immense yet visible only to the dead, or those that bore their blessing. Massive as the secret portal was, the figure that emerged from within was so tall it still had to stoop to fit through. A rune-emblazed wraith knight in a proud yellow and blue heraldry glided out of the interim portal, Two more of the immense ghost warriors in its wake. Long-barreled sun cannons thrummed loudly in the stillness. A shout of triumph rose up from the Inari as the giants opened fire. Blast after blast of intense plasma energy shooting from the entranceway of the hall. Wherever they struck, the demons tumbling through the hall's entrance to capture the escaping Eldar were annihilated. Everywhere, a new hunting pack of Serenishi creatures appeared, a killing volley of energy scoured them from existence. When a knot of chariots careened through the ranks of the Othway Eldar, blood flying from bladed wheels, one of the Wraith Knights stepped forward and smashed them to scattering shrapnel with a sweeping blow from its massive blade. Irain was the first to notice the smaller figures at the giant's feet. The fabled constructs of Craftworld Eandon had arrived, already spreading out to form a protective wall around the Inari. Among them was none other than Iana Arienel, the angel of Iandon. At the spirit seer's instruction, the ghost warriors formed a loose circle that spread out throughout their living comrades, then locked in tight. The wraith bone bulwark allowed every living Eldar through without resistance, yet hurled back their demon pursuers with volleys of firepower and methodical blade work. Many of the faceless warriors gave their lives to ensure their living kin could escape. Yana beckoned to Yanari into the golden portal. Realizing that to stay was to die, Yvain ordered the retreat. Group by group, the reborn dashed into the secret spar of the webway beyond. Perilous indeed were the hidden paths that the Yandan used to reach the Crone world and gather their waystone bounty. The Inari were led by not only the most gifted spirit seer of her generation, however, but also the Mask of the Midnight Sorrow. Though it took long weeks of arduous travel, they found the second of the Golden Portals without serious incident. A gateway that led them to a hidden webway portal of Craftworld Eandon within Vaith Wayport. Iana Arianel presented the Bone Singer's seal of her dynasty to a dozen runic locks sang in a linting soprano the lineage of Eldenesh and predicted her psyche into the spirit reservoirs beyond each grate until they opened soundlessly one by one. The expedition passed through into the chilly, mist-wreathed catacombs of the Craftworld's ghost halls. Each alcove 
once occupied by the inert shell of an inactive ghost warrior, was empty. There were sounds of distant thunder above. The Vizak cocked his head and loosened his great blade in its knotted scabbard. These were not the sounds of a tempest, but the din of ongoing battle. Evrain felt hope and despair in equal measure. They had found safety, just as it looked like they would be overwhelmed completely. And better yet, their rescuers were numbered amongst those craft-worlders they sought to bring to Inead's cause. In dying and being reborn within the domain of the ancient Eldrai, the Incarn had claimed the shape-changing sword of souls from within the soil of Belial IV. Yet the Inari had found only one of the two blades of power they sought from Belial IV before they had been forced to flee. Without all five of the crone swords, Inead's power would be significantly lessened. Worse still, the Sword of Rain had expected to find upon Iandan was missing. Its psychic spore nowhere to be found. The angel of Yandan, Yana, had a series of impassioned exchanges with Evrain as they gained the winding steps to the craft world's well-lit interior. The world ship was under siege once more. As it had passed through the Endrigan sector, a warp storm that had seemed distant one night was alarmingly close the next. From within that empiric tempest had come a pair of vast, rotten space hulks each a cadaverous mass of metal and rock, so pitied with age it had not seen a single straight line nor smooth contour upon it. The runic divinations of the Farseers had shown the immense composite ships to be infested with demonic life forms, just as a bloated corpse is infested with maggots. Vast swarms of rotflies, each led by a pinion demon prince, had flown from the repulsive space detritus towards Eandon upon membranous wings. With the warp storm propelling them, and with no need to breathe, they had descended upon Iandan in their thousands. Irain had a hollow feeling it was no accident that Iandan was assailed by demon invaders, just as she and her Inari had sought safe haven there, but she kept her peace on the matter. To a craft world that counted the dead as most numerous of its defenders, the message of Inyad's wakening was a delicate enough matter already. Within minutes of leaving the bridge of endless night, Evrain, the Vizak, the core of the Yanari, and Iyana Arianel were involuntary guests in Iandan's most sumptuous halls. Their every need was catered for, white robed elder adolescents on the path of the servant, offering refreshments and even cleaning their war gear of the crone's world's dust. Still, the truth was obvious to all. The reborn, those who believed Enead to be the savior of the elder so desperately needed, had been incarcerated against their will. Battling the stars high above still raged between Eandon's armada and the space hawks that drifted slow but unstoppable towards them. Evrain felt a slow burning rage building within her breast, but she tamped it down. The way of Cain would not release her from this. Neither Inari nor the Eandaini could afford a civil war. Instead, she had to reach inside herself, deeper than ever before, and let the conduit between all living things channel her soul. Outward she cast her essence, ever outward, her mind's eye reaching toward one star after another. That which she sought was not there. On the outer surface of Eandon, elephantine rotflies buzzed and swarmed, their pot-buried plague riders smearing filth upon crystal domes that had felt only the kiss of solar winds. A trio of Nurgle demon princes alighted nearby, Hands screeching gouges in the transparent domes. With rusted maces and wrought iron blades, they hammered the crystal over and over until they had forced open an entrance. The thin bubbles of atmosphere that surrounded the dome-like nodes fashioned to prevent the insides of the world ship being sucked out into space in the event of a meteor swarm gave the demons the shelter they needed to wriggle and crawl within. Through these apertures, the winged plague drones of Nurgle gained entry into the craft world, descending upon the elegant forests and sculptured gardens in a hideous greenish-brown cloud. They were swiftly intercepted by several shrines of swooping hawks that flitted, lasers blasting, just out of reach. The winged aspect warriors were swiftly joined by squadrons of crimson hunters, streaks of deep red scarring the air as they hunted the fat-bellied demon princes that befouled their home. 
The bright lances of their night-wing interceptors struck over and over, each an erringly accurate shot blasting streams of viscera from the chests and abdomens of the fleshy intruders. Galgor the virulent plummeted lifeless from the skies, but both Duke Orglor and Maliathus of the fetid claw descended towards the Eldar homelands below, as if unconcerned by their injuries, chortling with glee as their innards drizzled filth across the lands below. The Crimson Hunters performed tight loop-de-loops and came in again, this time aiming for the heads of their prey. With the swooping hawks thickening their fire, even the demon lords could not shrug off the intensity of their punishment. Oglor and Malathras fell like stones to explode in showers of filth upon the alabaster flagstones below. The demon riders assailing Eandon's forests did not get far, for they were contained and quarantined by unliving hosts of ghost warriors, yet the invasion was really only just beginning. In the firmament high above, the twin space hogs that had emerged from the warp drifted ever closer. Though the demons embattled under the Yandian surface were out much ten times over, the same could be said of Yandian's marder. Each of the space hawks that faced them was truly immense, a composite monstrosity formed of abandoned spaceships, space debris and asteroids the size of small moons. Many of the craft that jutted from the space hawks' flanks had active gun batteries that sent punishing broadsides towards the elder craft that harassed them from afar. The spacecraft of the Armada were nimble enough to simply evade any solid munitions, but not every weapon used by the Hawks was so conventional. When thousands of winged drones flew silently through the dark reaches of space to latch onto the solar sails of the Eldar ships, gnawing away at them like moss devouring silken finery, the Eldar vessels found themselves slowing to a crawl. Again, the Hawks opened fire, this time to full effect. So widespread and devastating were their volleys that they caught several Eandon craft amidships and destroyed them completely. Sequestered in her guest quarters, Evraine reached out more with her mind, with her powers. She could feel the energies of the Armada's demise even in her confinement. This time she was rewarded. Beyond it was a thin flare of intent, a soul sign coming from the allies she had sent ahead when Enyad had first arose. It was the psychic spore of Thrael Longblade, captain of the Mansbane. She peered through the crystalline skylights of her quarters, hoping to see a glint in the stars, and gave the psychic signal. The corsairs who knew Evrain as Amharok in Komora emerged from a field of stellar debris, their ships hidden from plain sight by hollow fields and mimic engines. Pulsar batteries keel torpedoes, phantom lances, and leech engines took their toll on the heavy hulk. Under sustained barrage, the engine bay reactors at the hulk's rear detonated with spectacular force. As a new star burned in the firmament, Evraine allowed herself a tight smile. The Fated Prince As Evraine's old comrades took their toll, Eandon's own Corsair allies joined the fight. With the smaller of the two Nurgle-infested spaceships destroyed by Amharok's Corsairs, both the Armada of Eandon and the warships of the Eldridge Raiders concentrated their firepower upon the larger vessel. Codified by Prince Iriel himself as Spawn of Organothir, like nimble star sharks tearing chunks from a void whale, the Corsairs' ships closed in, leveled their devastating attacks and slipped away. The crater-pitted Bemus' main defense was not guns, however, but its sheer bulk. It could be hammered by the guns of the Elder for days, and still have enough mass to destroy Yandan should it collide. The Hulk had drifted long in the haunted vides of the warp, even passing through the sickly green-gray skies of Nurgle's garden for a time. The demon infestation that had claimed it riddled its labyrinth innards right to the core, and thousands of winged demons wound from every new crater like ribbons of smoke. The tooth was becoming clear. If the Hulk's exterior was inviolate, it would have to be destroyed from the inside out by a strike force of Eldar, who would be risking the most hideous deaths imaginable. Prince Iriel, as ever, was quick to answer the call to action. In collusion with his fellow Corsair princes in Evrain's fleet, 
he organized a three-stage assault of the spawn of Aganothair. The plan was ambitious in the extreme, but necessarily so, for to approach the Hulk in a boring craft would be to become swamped by demonic rot flies before ever reaching its sides. The gamble was so daring that it appealed to Iriel's fellow captain's sense of pride and bravado, and within a matter of hours it was well underway. Virtually unnoticed by the combatants at large, Iriel and his captains left their ships aboard sleek assault craft and made for the webway portal at the rear of the craft world in Yandon. En route, Iriel used his rank as High Admiral to convince the world ship's steersman to adopt a specific course. Slowly, the beleaguered craft world came about upon the designated coordinates. Prince Iriel's insertion craft were nimble and swift enough to bypass the demon invaders that harassed Yandan's exterior, and they passed through the stern webway portal with acceptable losses. Using Iriel's uncanny hunter's instincts, in conjunction with ancient Orthanashi maps of the nearest labyrinth, they located the spar of that insane dimension that corresponded to the spawn of Oganathia's course. It was a heading Iriel had all but dictated by offering Iandan as the bait, as the spawn drifted through space towards the craft world, intent on ramming its prey. Iriel and his captains activated their personal webway portal devices and walked through the shimmering disks, crossing from the labyrinth dimension into the fetid heart of the enemy space hulk. The Eldar strike force stepped cautiously from the emerald portals they had opened into the cavernous interior of the infested enemy flagship. It was near pitch black inside, and a drizzle of foul fluid spotted down from a vaulted ceiling high above. The corsairs, anxious to avoid the pattern of stinking liquids, darted to the cover of the nearest corridors, and gingerly made their way further in. The faint sound of engines, pulsing regularly as a heartbeat, could be heard in the distance. Having come this far, the Corsairs were not keen to turn back without completing their mission, even if the slime-slicked innards that they were forced to navigate were more like the winding insides of a diseased sea monster than the ordered corridors of a spacecraft. Ariel and his fellow captains took comfort from the fact that they wore sophisticated air reservoirs and hermetically sealed armor, the finest that centuries of reaving could afford. It was well they did. Puffy balls of fungus, each formerly the head of an earlier transpasser, wheezed spores in billowing streams. For the intruders to breathe even a single handful of that blighted air would have resulted in a truly disgusting death. Though the Corsair princes had to cut their way through thickets of grasping, tentacle-like cilia and leap over bubbling pools of acidic slime, they proved dexterous enough to penetrate to the thrumming heart of the ship's engineerium. Thus far they had encountered little fiercer a foe than giggling demon mites, for their vector of attack had bypassed the demon hordes on the warpath at the outer edges of the hulk. When they reached the engines, however, they found a more daunting sight, the slime-slick cocoons of sulking beasts of Nurgle that had sought a warm place in which to make their vile metamorphosis. Perhaps the Corsairs would have swiftly disabled the Hulk's mighty engines and escaped without hindrance, had the swamp-like inner chamber not also been home to a squatting, sedentary terror. Gurgling at the chamber's heart was the vastly obese demon Pris Garol Gulgogor, whose name can only be pronounced correctly with a throat full of phlegm. Though the monstrously tentacle-like arms were whipped thin and dexterous, his abdomen was so engorged that it was impossible for him to move further than a few feet. Still, he laughed with good reason, for this day the prey had come to him. Whipping tendrils lashed out as Iriel jumped nimbly from one island of solid ground to another, the fabled spear of twilight blazing in his hand. One of them brushed the impeccably dressed corsair Prince Lumino on the heel and immediately hauled him screaming into the air dangling him with inviting range. A grisly snap, and the Eldar pirate was halved at the waist. His severed legs kicked spasmodically as Garagul Gogor finished his snack. Iriel grimaced as he leapt closer still, polearm blades slashing at the tentacles, whipping towards him to force them back. The damage was already done. 
Lumino's death scream had disturbed the pupae all around the room, and now many were beginning to shiver and shake, glistening wings and questing proboscis pushing from the fitted sacks. One by one, a swarm of fluid-drizzling rot flies emerged prematurely from their transformation, hissing and half-formed as they stirred from their slumber to malevolent wakefulness. Another corsair prince cried out as something grabbed his ankle. Spurred into action, the rot flies took wing as best they could, buzzing angrily as they lurched through the air towards the intruders. The horrified elder abandoned all attempt at stealth, opening fire in all directions. With that, the vaunted engine room erupted into violence from end to end. The battle that followed saw some of the most inspired displays of swordsmanship, agile footwork, and acrobatic poise outside the troops of Segara's favorite harlequins. The Corsair princes unleashed every weapon they could bring to bear. Drucero digital weapons, Elderai soul knives, Cormorite slasher prisms, and contraband elixirs that tripled the imbibers' reaction speed were all employed to ensure the demonic denizens could not lay a single talon upon the intruders, and for a while, there were enough. At the heart of the battle, Irel fought hardest of all. His spear glittering with killing energies as it slashed, whirled and stabbed at anything foolish enough to come within range. Running up the wall opposite Garogulgogor, Irel pushed backwards and away over a grasping tentacle, backflipping to spring once more off a gantry with great coat billowing. His spear was raised for a killing thrust. Garogulgogor heaved a spray of stingy vomit from the gills in his wattled throat, and though Iriel twisted and arced his spine to avoid it, he turned his back on the black pseudopods that reached out to pluck him from the air. In an instant, Iriel was caught like a fly in a spider's web, sticky tentacles wrapping around him to bind his arms to his side. The demon prince brought Iriel close, his jaws yawning wide. Suddenly, the chamber was lit by a stark white brilliance. Iriel's ocular implant, the Eye of Twilight, flared bright as it released a storm of killing electricity. The energies were so fierce, they burned away the demon's tentacles. The Corsair Prince was free once more. Down came the deadly spear of twilight that acclaimed so much of Iriel's life, its blade gouging deep, not into the demon prince, but into the beating heart of the Enginarium itself. A hideous shriek was wrenched from the demon overlord's throat as the unearthly energies of that baleful artifact went to work. Black veins spread out across the hulk's core machinery, necrotizing once living metal into shuddering black rust wherever they spread. Though it had taken every iota of his skill and ingenuity, Iriel had achieved his goal. He smiled momentarily as the spear's deathly energy slew its true target the heart of the spacefaring juggernaut itself. A whipping tentacle came around, a broken girder in its grip. Ariel was too exhausted to dodge. The heavy iron bar smashed the life from the Eldar Prince with a single blow. Garagulgagor, once he had finished killing the last of the interlopers in as gruesome a fashion as he could devise, slurped and shuffled his way to Prince Ariel's cooling corpse. Before his death, the Autark of Eandon had effectively becalmed the Hulk's only intact engineerium with a single stabbing blow of his eldritch weapon. Without the ability to correct the Behemoth's course, the Space Hulk was reliant on momentum alone and could likely be avoided. How could a mere mortal defy the will of Nurgle? Garagulgogor was still high in the favor of Grandfather Nurgle, for he had diligently spread disease for countless centuries and his particularly inventive brand of gallows humor was most amusing to the plague god. But with his plan to break the necromantic Eldar of Eandon in tatters, the demon prince would have to find another way to rise in his patron's estimation. Stirring a pool of blood-laced slime with one of his tentacles and reciting the seven sickening psalms, the demon reached out with its psychic abilities into the depths of the warp. There he had an epiphany. If his theory held true, and this warrior's blade was that which it appeared to be, there was still a chance to help Nurgle's power wax high. Not of its own slow, steady accord, 
but because of his chief rivals in the great game, would suddenly find his own star waning fast. At the very least, Garl Gulgogor could deliver a little gift to the Eldar world ship, one that would reduce it to ruin as surely as a direct collision with a space hulk. The demon prince frowned once more at Prince Iriel's spear, clutched in its owner's death grip and still glowing gently with baleful energies. Then, as shuddering waves of mirth wobbled Garagul Gagor's seven great chins, his consternation turned into a belly laugh that shook rust from the rafters high above. It was not long after Yandan had left the grotesque space hulk behind that Prince Iriel's body, frozen in a strange milky resin with the spear of twilight laid across his chest, was found floating in space. The entombed corpse was covered by a team of Helmlock Wraith fighters that had sensed its presence in the stars. By using a remote Wraith construct familiar on a silver tether, they were able to retrieve the corpse and take it back in safety to the craft world itself. A great sadness rippled through the world ship of the news, for Ariel was their brightest star, a once wayward genius who had proven to be a Yandan savior more than once. His loss was so profound that many elder were seen weeping openly in the streets. What must the Andan do, they wailed, to escape the cursed fate that haunted its every turn? To weave the skein. Irene had called upon old debts from her former life as Amharok, and in doing so aided Iandan. With that, the reborn were vindicated in the eyes of the Craftworld seers, and were allowed to fight as one against the creatures invading the Craftworld ship. The Yanari banished not only swathes of plague demons, but also the infections they spread. All forms of life are hastened to their very end when Inyad's ire is raised. Prince Iriel's body was quarantined after its recovery. After the grisly fate of the Seers of Luganath, all Eldar have feared the plague god's gifts. The resinous shell that contained Iriel was broken open by race constructs in the barren chamber, a sealed oval room isolated from the wider infinity circuit by the spirit seer's art. That caution was well exercised. The prince's corpse yielded a cloud of plague spores that would have turned living, breathing elder to walking hotbeds of contagion. News of the corpse's infection was physically conveyed to a spirit seer, and from there to Iyana Arianel. Evraine was soon escorted to the antechamber outside Iriel's resting place. She called out to the ghost warriors inside, bidding them retreat into the airlock-style vestibule on the far side of the chamber, and then drew her blade. Holding it aloft, she summoned forth the spirit magic in her soul and, molding the necromantic energies with her psyche, sent waves of lethal energy into the chamber beyond. Though they had no effect on Uriel, by this point he was beyond harm. They killed every single spore and microorganism that Garagolgogor's filthy curse had unleashed upon the craft world. It was then that a true miracle took place. Uriel ran three fingers down the length of the Baron Chamber's doors, and they opened soundlessly before her. Two of her Iandan wraithblade escorts crossed their curved blades to bar her passage to the sacred place, but Iyana Arianel waved them aside. Irain sketched a curtsy to her ally before striding inside with a contented smile on her features. She took up the Spear of Twilight, reversed it in her grip, and plunged it into Iriel's chest. With a great heaving exultation, the Corsair Prince of Iandan sat bolt upright. His pallid flesh was restored to a vigor it had not seen since before he took up his fabled spear. The blade, having returned the stolen life force it had siphoned from its wielder over the years, turned to Quicksilver in Yvain's grip. It took a new shape, revealing its true form as the fifth of the Crone Swords. She passed it back to Iriel, and in his grip it became a spear once more. The pirate prince stood unsteadily, then straightened to his full height, a new power glowing from his eyes. Prince Ariel of Iandan had been reborn. Soon he would be far from alone. The harrowing odyssey of Rain and the reborn 
had been the subject of much interest in the cabal of the Black Heart. The supreme overlord, as Dubal Vect, had far more pressing matters to attend to, for Komara was racked by the most severe of disjunctions, and his Aeon's old power base was literally falling apart. Yet he could not shake the desire for vengeance upon the upstart gladiatrix that had triggered this turbulent uprising that night in the Crucible Arena, and causing divisions amongst the Cormorites, a sentiment shared by a great many of the homunculi who had long considered themselves the true masters of Dark Elda society. The destruction of Cormora was an eventuality Vect had long planned for. He was a past master at ensuring that when misfortune befell the Dark Elder, his rival suffered the worst. Often, it transpired that it was Vect's hidden hand behind the disaster in the first place. Though he implied to his servants that he had deliberately triggered the cataclysm to relieve his immortal ennui, Vect was secretly livid that his personal fiefdom had been defiled and his contingency plans forced into sudden reality. Whilst his rivals scrambled to salvage the remnants of their once glorious holdings amidst a spreading warp quake, Vect was already well established elsewhere, populating the ruins of ancient port cities and turning them into sprawling fortresses. He offered safe haven to those who sought his protection, at a price, of course, and he prepared for his long campaign of counterattack. Meanwhile, the cataclysm of the Dark City occurred in a series of chain reactions. The underground river Cades burst its banks as a slew of Nurgle's demons flopped into its acrid reaches, surging onto the streets above to trigger waves of necrotizing plague. With the midspires largely unguarded, Zinchian sky sharks and the fiery chariots of demon sorcerers roared into the skies flames spiraling as they clashed with the murder packs of the populated Komara skyscrapers. When the demons of corn poured through empty streets to invade the spool of, of Sekmegera, the most nefarious, hardened mercenaries and pirates of the galaxy united as a single army in the face of swarming bloodletters and rampaging greater demons. The hordes of Sinesh, beside themselves with ecstasy, sated themselves with orgies of violence unbound as they massacred Cormorite cabals spire by spire. That immense and complex metropolis had power enough to swallow even a major demon incursion and quarterize the areas deemed irretrievable, but it was far too fractious a domain for unified defense. Many of the Dark City's Archons tried to slay their rivals under the pretense of fighting back the demon hordes, their actions adding to the mayhem. Skirmishes and gang wars broke out in the streets in escalating measure, for this time there was no cabal of the Black Heart to bring the city to bloody order. Like a palace made of dominoes given a single push, Cormara suffered a chain reaction of disasters. Around the Crucible, the escaped Tyranids that would once have been put down with relative ease carved a red path through the domains of the witch cult. Archon Scythrak, Counterattacked after a vicious but costly coup staged against the lords of the Iron Throne was beheaded by the shadow creature Karadurak. With this singular and grisly kill, the decapitator finally claimed the last perfect skull he needed for his dark work. Flaying it and licking his trophy clean, he used it to complete the underground ritual he had been obsessively fashioning from the stolen heads of his prey over the last eight millennia. The gaze of a thousand perfect skulls met in the middle of his lair and bored a hole in the wall between worlds, opening a gateway to the midnight dimension of the Mandrakes. A morass of shadow assassins and tenebrous monsters spilled like an inky flood through the streets and slew every soul within a dozen miles. In the space of a single night, that region became the shadowy kingdom of the decapitator, long-lost monarch of the Mandrakes. His was a reign of terror, his throne set with a sea of living shadows that consumed even the demon invaders that strayed within its grasp. On the third night, that shadowy army combined its strength with the fleshy hordes of the homunculi covens. Endless menageries of twisted flesh things and shadow demons surged up from the dark city's underworld, and the mayhem of the demon incursion began to lose momentum. 
the cabals and witch cults regrouped somewhat, using their knowledge of the Dark City to fight back against the warp-born invaders. As the dark suns burned overhead, Cormorat's fate hung in the balance. In Vect's presence, the topic of the Distunction's cause was already taboo. The Supreme Overlord had already claimed he had a vrain in his power, and that he and his homunculus allies were painstakingly extracting every ounce of the power she had shown in the Crucible. Though there had been no proof of it, none were foolish enough to call him a liar to his face. Vect had publicly tortured the steersmen and corsair warriors Ivrain had abandoned in her flight from the city, but of the gladiatrix herself there was no sign. Rumors were circulating that Vex's claim was hollow, and his rivals, his former paramour Lady Malis of the Poisoned Tongue, foremost amongst them, were doing everything in their power to ensure that Vex's authority and dominance was undermined. In secret, Vect was sparing no expense in the search for Yvrain, and Urien Rakath's prophets of flesh were pulling every string they could in order to track down the Yanari. Without the aid of their Harlequin allies, the Yanari would likely already be captured, but for now, they had slipped the net. To Rakath, the rumors of soul magic were both intoxicating and horrifying. They hinted of a prize worth any cost to the nigh-immortal coven lords, whilst also representing a manner of death that even a homunculus ancient would not be able to escape. Word had already reached the master flesh crafters of the embodiment of Iniad that had fought the coven sent to Belial IV. Upon their return to Cormora, the homunculi had ascertained that their worst fears were true. Their slain fellow had been entirely reduced to dust by the powerful revenant magic of the Incarn. Every vat clone, phylactery hidden remnant, and secret skin sample had been desiccated to nothingness. Somewhere out there was a power to wield both inescapable death and life eternal. War in the Labyrinth With a galactic cataclysm unfolding around them, Yerari made haste to the ghost halls as soon as the Anandan Seer Council had reached its decision. Using her influence over the spirits of the dead, Irene worked every available moment to transfer the consciousness of ancient heroes from the Infinity Circuit directly into the race-bone bodies that they had previously only controlled via the use of spirit stones. These ghost warriors were now trapped in a waking dream, but given new life by Irene and her kin, able to see, feel, and hear the material world around them with all the clarity they had possessed as mortals. Though mute, their gratitude was obvious in their deference. The stiffness and uncertainty of the typical race construct was replaced by a fluid grace, as the statuesque spirit warriors adjusted to their new forms. Before long, those newly realized ghost warriors had taken up the artifacts and heraldry of their mortal incarnations. They were truly reborn. With their senses singing and their thirst for vengeance undiminished, the ghost warriors of Yandan were more formidable than ever. In conjunction with Iana Alianel and her spirit seer brethren, the High Priestess of Iniad brought entire ghost halls to full wakefulness. The race bone constructs were filled with purpose. They felt the presence of Iniad calling them to war. For if any could command them from beyond the veil, it was the God of the Dead. Within a matter of days, the Inari made for the webway once more. This time, they went with not only elements of the Swordwind, ghostly emissaries from Antanasar, and strike forces from the craft worlds amongst their ranks, but also with a mighty host of reborn ghost warriors. Many of the Andeni traditionalists objected ferociously to what they saw as a crippling blow to the worldship's defenses, but the newly realized constructs would not listen to even the most compelling argument and would not allow themselves to be stopped. Few had the nerve to stand before the ancient heroes of the Eldar race and tell them to stand down in the name of passivity and caution. The future of their entire race was at stake, and the dead would do everything in their power to ensure that their living brethren were beyond the reach of she who thirsts. From the sternmost portals of Iriandon, the swollen ranks of the reborn made for the depths of the webway once more. 
To use those esoteric pathways often carries a cost. Even with the Harlequins of the Midnight Sorrow to guide them, the Inari found their progress painfully slow. Fractal complexities haunted their peripheral vision, surreal dreams assailed their minds, and false turns confounded them every night. Half real, half of the warp, that twilight dimension was in places as much the domain of the Dark Gods as that of the Eldar, or rather the old ones that had come before. The chaos-tainted wilderness of the webway, long abandoned even by the Harlequins, had become the stalking grounds of Ahriman, arch-sorcerer of the Thousand Suns. A devotee of Zinch, Ahriman had once been a mystical warrior of the Imperium, noble and just. In the millennium-long search to save his cursed legion, he walked such dark paths he became consumed by ambition and revenge. Araman's former master, the demon Primarch Magnus, had wrought a great doom for the Space Wars, those executioners that had hounded his legion to near extinction. In doing so, he had not only brought utter devastation to the Fenris system, but also used the tremendous magical forces he had unleashed to force his own power base, the demonic planet of the sorcerers, through the veil between the warp and real space. That cataclysmic act of metaphysical manipulation had seen a dozen new warp storms spiral into being across the galaxy. Empowered, the Legion of the Thousand Suns had risen again in power and prominence. The Thousand Suns were a force like no other. In the name of enlightenment, they had dabbled with the energies of the warp so deeply that a flaw in their gene seed had mutated out of control with some of their number turned into fleshy monsters robbed of all sanity. Araman had cast a great spell, the rubric, to preserve what was left of his fellows, but in doing so had been too successful. He had turned his kin from mutable flesh to unliving dust sealed inside baroque suits of armor. Since that day, the arch-sorcerer had sought a way to rescue his fellows from their deathly and soulless half-life. He had needed little spurring to seek out the Anari. In their travails within the webway, the reborn had come to the notice of many a baleful eye. Through the whispered cant of demons, word had reached Araman of a new force in the galaxy that could defy death, and even resurrect those whose spirits still lingered. With all haste, he gathered his demon servants and sent them into the twilight between worlds to serve as his eyes and ears. Here was a chance to save his legion in earnest, and possibly restore them body and soul. He had sent several thrall bands of his servants alongside Abaddon's Black Legion to the ice moon Clasus, for he had foreseen that planet as a nexus of fate in the greater schemes of Zinch. Yet that was a distraction from his own self-imposed mission, a task he still considered selfless but which was more truthfully yet another quest for power and vindication entwined. If his ancients in the webway spoke even a whisper of possible redemption for his legion, he would snatch it up with both hands. Then, once he had wrought the Inari's secrets from their pain-wracked bodies, he would use their power over life and death as he saw fit. When they had first ventured into the webway from Komora, the relatively small size of the Inari expedition and lent them stealth. They had evaded the notice of Araman's diminutive spies, for the webway is impossibly convoluted and beyond the ken of all but Segara himself. He had bolstered by warriors from Biotan, Ulthwe, Yandan, Ortanaza, and several other craft worlds that had been drawn to their banner. The Yanari had become a force that could no longer hide. Araman, having stolen passages of the fabled Tomb Labyrinthus, from the Black Library and deciphered their mind-bending secrets, knew many of those shattered spars that had been claimed by Chaos. He had even learned to scry regions of the webway at will, the better to catch his prey unawares. The sorcerer waited for his moment to strike with the attentiveness of a serpent. Ten millennia of pursuing his arcane agendas had given him a terrible patience. When the Inari strayed into the Psychedelta, a many tunnel region where the walls of the webway were thin, the sorcerer conducted a great ritual of translocation 
sacrificing 999 captives to the glory of Zinch. The changer of ways was pleased, and a few moments later, our men burst from the ether to attack the Inari with a host of thousand suns and gibbering demons at his back. The battle that ensued scorched the still air of the Webway Delta. It was a pyrotechnic display of raw Zinchia magic pitted against the expert skill and spiritual conjurations of the reborn. Initially, the battle was fought on a narrow frontage, every thrall band and demon host pushing with relentless, tireless strength into the ranks of the Yanari. The Eldar reacted instinctively, flowing and darting around every push and thrust with the expertise of master duelists. Then, as the Yanari were forced to give ground by the sheer power and suddenness of the Chaos Assault, the battle flowed back to the neck of that section of the webway, spreading into every one of the contradictory capillaries of the Psyche Delta. Before long, a half-dozen battles were being fought in parallel or in tunnels atop another, each force giving everything it had to break past the other, and in doing so, win a critical advantage by attacking on two fronts in a neighboring engagement. High on a crystal bridge that seemed open to the void of space, a host of Yandan's guardians and ghost warriors were led into battle by the Wraith Knight Soul Seeker. A phalanx of thousand sun terminators barred their path across the apex of the bridge, but the Wraith led host slowed not at the sight. Where they had once moved in ponderous strides, the blank helmed constructs now ran with the easy grace of the living Eldar that loped behind them. The complex warp tech guns held tightly to their broad chests. Guardian heavy weapon platforms set a steady hail of shuriken cannon fire into the ornamented armored terminators, the shredding discs shattering or ricocheting from ensorcelled ceramite without visible effect. The scarab called to return fire, their combi bolters stitching thunderous explosions across the oncoming Eldar constructs, but in turn did little more than scorch their inviolable forms. The thousand suns swiftly switched targets, picking out the guardians behind with uncanny marksmanship to take a gory toll. The sorcerers in their midst sent vivid helixes of light shooting out to trap the race guards in cages of azure luminescence. These then contracted to slice through race bone as if it were raw meat, until only chunks of ivory anatomy were left behind. Those terminators armoured with rotary cannons and hellfire rocket launchers poured in enough warp-cursed firepower to dismember two of the leading ghost warriors. The irresistible force of Thousand Sun's firepower had met the immovable object of the race host and found their edge not in technology, but in magic. Soul Seeker loomed over the front line, his flickering shield generator casting a pale aegis of light across the leading elements that prevented the worst of the magical storm from taking a greater toll. The race guard, so protected from the Terminator's salvos, seized the moment, running in close to open fire with the distortion weaponry. Howling vortices of warp energy simply snatched away their heavily armored targets as if they had been sucked from an open airlock into space. Soul Seeker charged through the Thousand Sun ranks, braving salvos of mutagenic fire that would have turned a mortal target inside out, and swept his immense ghost blade across a span of the enemy battle line. The Dolorous Blow cut several of the Scarab Occult in half at the waist, breaking the Thousand Suns at cohesion. Suddenly, the Yandan race blades were in amongst them, fighting with grace and efficiency of movement as their axes hewed apart suits of Prosperine battleplate. Tortured by so many arcane forces clashing at once, the crystal bridge shuddered, shook, and cracked along its length. Some of the race constructs were fast enough to leap from one crackling flow of crystal to another until they reached the safety of the far side. Others were not so lucky and tumbled away into nameless, fractal oblivion. Nearby, the demon-choked tunnels of the Psyche Delta's rightmost spa were lit brightly with warp flame. Cackling pink horrors and flamers drizzled fire with manic glee as they lurched and bounded towards their quarry. Amongst them, were towering lords of change, each hurling their own devastating spells at the oncoming Eldar. The Beotan spearhead that faced that flaming host suffered a thousand deaths in the space of a few terrifying minutes. Where the mutagenic flames touched an Eldar warrior, 
manifest insanity was left behind. A squad of howling banshees were turned to infants in outsized armor and looked at their blades in fascination. A trio of winged swooping hawks were transformed to a scintillating rain of scaled serpents. A shrine of dire avengers, having released a hurricane of razored shuriken, found their projectiles reversing course to attack them with the avidity of starving piranhas. Each inventive demise brought great merriment to the horrors that massed around the Lords of Change. For a while, the webway echoed with skirling hilarity. The laughter stopped when figures of legend strode forth, brought together once more by the mighty Jane Zar. Majestic as Cain himself, the Phoenix Lords emerged from the darkness of the webway one by one. It was not Azumad at their fore, but his foremost student, she who had taken Iniad into herself and found her way back to the Reborn. Baharoth dived low, blinding beams searing from his multi-barreled rifle to burn the eyes from a lord of change as he passed. His sword took its head with contemptuous ease as he shot past it in a sapphire blur. Faced with a horde of assailants, Janus asked Span, polearm blade carving a deadly spiral around her. Her Triskel shot outward. It cleaved pink-skinned demons in twain on the way out then slashed through blue-skinned replicas on the way back as it returned to her hand. The brimstone horrors that scattered the ground in their place shrieked at the sight of Fugan, the burning lance striding swathed in the heat of a thousand fiery deaths. They ran back howling to set fires amongst the thousand suns that came behind, hissing in impatience. The Lord of Change, Zarsapt, the ineffable, strode forward to bathe Fugan in warpfire, but its mutagenic curse could not touch the Phoenix Lord's scaled armor. A moment later, he blasted the creature into discorporate mist with a pinpoint beam from his fire pike. Asuman ran a beaked Zinch Herald through with the blade of Asur, hoisting its wriggling body high, so his dire avenger acolytes could shred it to nothingness with shuriken fire. Morgan Ra, standing legs braced atop a fallen wraith knight, methodically shot every blade-winged screamer from the sky with such impeccable skill that not a single one of the Morgatar's shuriken failed to hit its mark. His bio-explosive rounds he saved for the burning chariots trailing flame through the skies. Each turned to a fiery meteor as they were sent crackling into the hordes below. The greater demon, Vexwing, teleported into being behind him, stave raised to lay him low, but the blow never landed. Before the blow could land, Karandras struck from behind, melting from the shadows to hack the avian horror into shimmering nothingness with biting blade and scorpion's claw. The Phoenix Lord's skill at arms outmatched the demon host to such a degree that not one of the horrors or their flame-hurling bestial brethren could lay a single claw upon them. Here, amongst the tight press of battle, the first exarchs were lethality personified. In the next spa, at the foremost tip of the Inari advance, the warriors of Ulthway raced to close quarters with the tightly packed rubriquet. The back guardians had felt the sting of the thousand suns in sorcelled fusillades before. They knew from experience that a single inferno bolt could blast an elder limb from limb. Yet they faltered not, for they knew the god of the dead was watching over them. In rushing the enemy lines, they invited decimation, and indeed, Many irreplaceable lives were lost. It would likely have been a massacre, but for the presence of Eldred Uthran. The High Farseer cast the runes of war to lend uncanny fortune to his kin, while his close ally, Kaiser Duras the Anchorite, sent storms of crackling lightning within the ranks of the Thousand Suns to disrupt their firing lines. Araman parted the sea of his warriors with a wall of psychic force before replying with his own volley of magic. Transmutative flames struck out, turning the elder Farsi Kaisaduras into a crude wooden statue that was caught eternally in a pose of desperate anguish. With the Othwians came the Mask of the Midnight Sorrow, their shadow seer casting a veil of mist over the dire avengers that sprinted alongside them. Where a volley of blazing bolts roared in, the mist saw the fiery bolts pass through the aspect warriors as if they were made of no more than shadow. The blitzing attack had gained the Othway warhost a good deal of ground. However, as their Harlequin allies flipped and danced through the air around them, 
The Eldar hit the thousand signs line like a bladed tornado. The armoured automata suddenly found themselves hard-pressed. The heirloom blades and energised weapons of the reborn slashed open ancient power armour at the waist, the shoulder and the neck. Each blow aimed with pinpoint precision to ensure as telling a cut as possible. The tactic worked well, and for a triumphant few seconds the Eldar advanced over dismembered suits of battle plate that lay gently steaming in the mist. Then Araman pointed his staff, and geysers of pink fire roared out to consume the harlequins vaulting towards him. Three graceful warrior dancers were caught mid-leap. They landed as scatterings of dust. At the same time, the ranks of beleaguered thousand sons seemed to wake from their dreamlike torpor and attack with sudden speed, shoulder barging, punching and clubbing the Eldar to the ground with the stocks of their bolters, before stamping down to mangle flesh and crush bone. In a crackle of warp light, Eldred materialized amongst a thousand suns, the glowing staff of Orthanar spinning to shatter their armor as if the ancient battle plate were made of no more than fine china. The fight in the tunnel descended into anarchy around him, as the Orthwayans pressed in again and again, their morbid black and bone armor lit by the neon bright, mind searing hues of the raging psychic battle. In anarchy and mayhem, the forces of Zinch thrived. Riding upon etheric wings came the exiles, gathered over their millennia to Araman's side. Nine was their number, each a sorcerer of incredible power who had, alongside their master, transformed the thousand suns to their unliving state. Some strode through the air itself, footsteps blazing in their wake. Others came on bladed discs that soared through the air, or rode fiery chariots pulled by swift sky-ray demons. The triumvirate of Enyad had been sighted on the front line, and the psychic signal had been sent. The reborn were fighting hard to break through the Thousand Suns' ambush with rain at their head, and it was time to close the trap. The bird-headed azure Manutech stretched his feathery wings into claws, grabbing and ripping the air. Fifty meters distant, incubi bladesmen were tore bodily apart by invisible forces. The skull-mantled biomancer Narat of the Broken Troth stunned a knot of Eldar with a blast of kaleidoscopic light before casting knuckle bones at their feet like a farmer scattering grain. Each osseous seed grew swiftly into a fleshless corpse, the unliving warriors clattering forward to lock bony fingers around the limbs of the nearest Eldar. Araman himself tied an invisible noose and pulled it taut. A score of those Eldar closest to him clutched at their throats, as all breath was sucked from their bodies. Each new spell took a terrible toll. Here, so close to the warp from which they drew their power, the millennium-old sorcerers of the Thousand Suns could mould reality to their desires with the twitch of a finger. Towards them came Ivraine, her face twisted in a snarl. Her proud strut turned into a purposeful run, her expression that of a lioness who had seen her cubs cut down by a cruel assailant. Kavir, the Sword of Sorrows, sang at her side, the edge of its blade glowing white with psychic corpuscent. With her came the Vizarg, his own crone sword held poised to strike, and the Incarn, howling with the voice of a thousand departed souls. Empowered by the deathly energies around them, they moved faster than any mortal creature should, whispering potent curses. If rain cut the air with her fan, and six scalpel-sharp dirks flew on deathly wings to impale a chanting sorcerer. Another found his spell cut short as a Visarch ran in close, the sword of silent screams casting a pile of soundless twilight around him as a great blade sheared off the front half of the exile's helmet and bisected his head with it. Nearby, the Incarn rose high like a bird of prey on a hot thermal, only to swoop down forcefully. The quicksilver sword of souls flowed to become two daggers that slashed and stabbed at thousand suns, each striking with a demigod strength behind them. A circle of rubriquet turned their guns on the creature, but although their exposure salvos tore bloodless chunks from the Incarn's torso, they could not shift the cruel smile from its face. A spiraling vortex of spiritual energy whirled out from the creature's opening moor, and a thousand suns froze like statues. The mystical animating forces from within them had been reduced to nothing more dangerous than echoes. Yvain felt her hatred flare hot, 
her gyrinx growling at her side. There was their leader, commanding the throng from his perch on a disc of fiery metal. Casting aside her finery, she shot towards him like a living missile, her companions close on her heels. Calmly putting his staff aside, the champion of Zinch cupped his hands as if trapping a winged insect and hurled a handful of nothingness upwards with a roar. Along with the Vizark and the Incarn, Evane suddenly found herself adrift, not within the webway, but without. They were stranded in a near-silent limbo, trapped on the top of the psychocrystal walls. The sounds of battle were muffled beneath them, and the cool wind sucked in its breath at their backs. Evane did not look around, for she felt something there in the darkness. A voice in her mind said she should do so. She would behold the changer of the ways himself and learn the meaning of madness. The advice was not elder, but human. It belonged not to a salvaged soul, but to the arch-sorcerer below. Another joined in, that of Illyrioch the Sage, one of the spirit passengers within her. She had studied this one at length. A flash of insight struck of rain. Arzek Ariman, she shouted. I have that which you seek. I can restore your brethren. A stone's throw away, the Vizark cut at the webway's exterior with a sword of silent screams, but he could not scratch it. The Incarn hissed in pain to her flank, trailers of purple mist unwinding from its body, as if it was dissolved by the ether behind. And why should I believe that? came the monstrous voice in Yvrain's head. You have no power here, in my new domain. She felt white heat as something loomed behind, the fell gaze of godly eyes burning down upon her with terrible inhuman focus. Open your eyes, she cried, secretly praying to Inead that her desperate gambit would work. She pressed her hands upon the psycho crystal of the webway's exterior, focused on the armored legionaries within, and reversed the cycle of their existence. Araman, before taking up the defensive stance of the Emperor's legionaries, a dozen of thousand sun rubric marines, previously levering firepower into the reborn with the emotionless efficiency of automatons, staggered backwards as if struck. They looked at one another, clutched their hearts, and fell back. Rallying around Araman, before taking up the defensive stance of the Emperor's legionis astartes. Evain could just make out their words as they frantically sought to make sense of their situation. Arzak, is that you, brother? Where are the Athenians? These are Eldar we face this day. In the name of Magnus, what is going on? Araman shook his head as if stunned, his wide shoulders shaking uncontrollably with mirth, grief, or a mixture of the two. He brought his cupped hands together once more, and yanked Inead's luminaries downward with a shout of pure exultation. A lurch of the stomach, and Ivrain suddenly found herself in the swirling tide of battle once more, the Vizak and the Incarn quickly taking up positions behind her. Do it, she said to her companions, siphoning the rich reservoir of Eldar life force that flooded the tunnels into a single burst of invigorating energy. In a flash, the Iron Denny, giant Soul Seeker, was there, trailing white flame as his race blade carved a chasm through the crystal of the webway's superstructure with an ear spitting scream. Stepping to the edge of the fissure, the Incarn opened its maw impossibly wide. It inhaled so mightily the resurrected thousand suns were drawn towards it, stumbling over the edge of the chasm to fall into the void beneath. Adaman screamed in denial riding his disc after them on a trail of fire. The whispering god gives new life, said Evrain, as her reborn surged forward around her for the kill, just as he takes life away. Clash on the Ice Moon With Araman defeated and the majority of his thrall bands trapped on the far side of a metaphysical chasm, the battle for the Psyche Delta swiftly turned in favor of the Reborn. Irain and her followers were initially forced to backtrack, joining their rear guard at the mouth of the Delta, and taking the two spars that led to the relative safety of the arterial tunnels beyond. Though perhaps only half their number had made it to the other side alive, 
Those who had died had their spirit zone secured by the living. They would fight on, just as scores of departed elder already fought on within a vrain. Of the Incan and the Phoenix Lords, there was no sign, but for a tunnel packed with the swiftly discorporating remains of a thousand demons. The Harlequins of the Midnight Sorrow once more took their place as guardians for the greater mass of the Inari, following the laughter of Segura, as a ship follows a lighthouse's beam. The Laughing God had been most amused by Evrain's gambit, and was of a mind to help her to a destination. Twisting the fabric of fate to confound the Dark Gods had long been Segura's way, but he yearned for a brother in arms, for his fellow gods were long ago devoured by she who thirsts. Though awakened, Inyad was somber and sinister in comparison to Segura's riotous, colorful demeanor, and any force in the galaxy could deny Sarnesh was worth fighting for. To rebuild a trinity of Eldar deities, with Cain as a fell handed destroyer, Inyad as a giver of life after death, and the laughing god to balance the two, that was a truly worthy goal. Indeed, some amongst the Inari had already begun to talk of the gods as a small pantheon, and even pay homage to them in thought, deed, and sumptuous regalia, becoming an echo of the ancient Eldari in microcosm. One of the spirits is, upon seeing this, asked if the equivalent female trinity was to set Iana Arianal as the maiden, Ivrain as the mother, and Eddie Hesperax as the crone. Though a sharp glance from a crucible blood bride cut short her mirth. With the Harlequin's divine patron guiding them out of the webway, the Inari made good speed for the ice-locked moon of Clasus. Orbiting the planet of Castle Horn, it was as pallid as a corpse's skin and swiftly swirling with blizzards. Eldred had seen the white orb clear in his visions. Indeed, he had been dreading its coming, for in his glimpses of the future, he had seen its snow stained by blood. To the Elder, such an omen was truly feared. It symbolized the spilt blood of Eldenesh at the hands of the war god Cain, and a severing of the peaceful accord between the Elder and their deities. The High Farseer still had hopes that omen was inverted, a sign of imminent disaster not for the Elder, but for their enemies. They approached a confluence of fate where they would join forces with humanity and in doing so, strike a blow against the dark gods that could yet prevent the fabric of the universe from unraveling. Unbeknownst to the Elder and the Yanari, the omen spoke true for every kindred that set foot upon the cursed moon of Clasus. The murderous hordes of Abaddon's Black Crusade were already on the attack upon that ice-locked orb, waging war on the Imperials that followed the vision of the living Saint Celestine. As the Yanari came to the spherical webway portal that led to the Crone's Claw Mountains, they gathered one final time to commune in the name of Inyad. A swathe of Aspect warriors from Beeltarn were the first to holy and trust their souls to the Whispering God. Inspired, they finally found the inner steel to put aside their helms and their war personas. In doing so, honoring not just Cain in one of his aspects, but also Inyad trusting to an existence beyond the grave. Should they die, their souls would find salvation in those Inari nearby. In doing so, the reborn would deny Selenish her feast, join with Inyad in the afterlife, and continue the fight against chaos forevermore. Massing for battle alongside Eldred and the Black Guardians of Orthway was a faction from the Cult of Strife. Les Hesprax had agents of her own, in hearing of Avrain's intended destination from her Harlequin contacts, she had sent a force of skilled arena fighters to take up arms alongside the Inari. If these witches reported back that the Inari truly were able to allay the sole curse that afflicted the Dark Eldar, then Lelis herself would seek them out and fight for Inyad's cause. Avrain suspected that Lelis' motivations were purely selfish. The Belladonna of the arenas would give almost anything for an immortality of adoration without having to pay a constant cost in souls. Still, with her forces badly depleted by Araman's strike, Evraine welcomed her kin from the dark city with open arms. Nearing the webway gate, 
if rain traced lines of psychic fire around the tiny trigger sphere that hung in mid-air before her, setting in motion the opening of the portal. A thin hint of icy wind became a gust, then a gale of freezing cold as the webway gate unraveled the quantum barrier between the labyrinthine dimension and the ice-locked mountain top of the crone's claw. The Anari plunged through the fractal portal, only to behold a vision of utter carnage. The precipice ringed hollow of the portal's site was almost hemispherical, its lip ringed with sharp rocks. Beyond it was wasteland stained with blood. A trail of corpses led for miles into the middle distance, many of the wounded and the dying pulling themselves through the gory slush in search of safety. Here were the Imperials that Eldred had spoken of, their strength all but destroyed by the ravages of chaos. They had clearly been forced marched through the snow, assailed by the infamous Black Legion as they presumably sought the same webway gate from which the Inari emerged. It was here that they had decided to make their last stand, unaware of just how close they had come to the ancient Xenos structure. Too stubborn or stupid to realize they had no chance of victory, the Imperials fought back with a desperate ferocity. A disarrayed assortment of Black Templar Space Marines, Sisters of Battle, Imperial Guardsmen, and Adeptus Mechanicus forces fought at the feet of battle-ravaged Imperial Knights, guns barking as they gave their lives to defend three warriors in their midst. Inquisitor Greyfax of the Ordo Hereticus, the Archmagos Dominus, known as Belisarius Call, and the living saint herself, Celestine of the Martyred Lady. All of this the Inari took in at a glance, for the Elder has senses so sharp, even a blizzard is little hindrance to them. The Wind Riders of the Black Guardians were first into the fray, the Witches of the Cult of Strife close on their heels. The Imperials, pushed beyond breaking point, could only stare in disbelief and wonderment as Yanari warriors flowed like a river around them to crash against the Black Legion. The Chaos Space Marines had hounded their quarry across Clasus, only to find themselves denied at the last. Now it was the blood of the Black Legion that turned the moon's snows crimson, the smoking corpses of mutant traitors to humanity that lay thick upon the ground. Seeing the large force of Eldar suddenly appear to repel his assault was enough to give even Abaddon pause, but he drove forward nonetheless. Twice he assailed the ridge of the crone's claw, and twice he was hurled back. His numbers sorely reduced. After the third time, he angrily ordered a tactical withdrawal. The bedraggled Imperials had reached safety of a sort. The Road to Salvation in the dubious safety of the Crone's Claw, that natural bowl housing the Clasus race gate, human and elder watched each other warily. The ragtag Imperial warriors were exhausted, wounded or dying. Barely a hundred of them huddled around the giant Trieros conveyor that the Archmagos in their midst clearly valued more than life itself. Incredibly, the light of battle still burned in every warrior's eyes, that and the certainty of absolute faith. The Yanari, knowing well the horrors that the Black Legion would have unleashed upon these hapless humans, took note of that determination, and looked with admiration upon the stubborn resolve of the survivors. To stand against the infamous despoiler in person and remain unbowed, it was a feat worthy of the Dark Muses. Though it ran against the grain of their souls, even the witches of the Cult of Strife felt a kind of respect. The Elder, Upon seeing the winged figure of the living saint parted their ranks so a clear corridor led from the Yanari leaders to Celestine. To her left stood Inquisitor Greyfax, as suspicious of the saint as she was of the Xenos. To Celestine's right was the Martian priest. His servo-wise followed a lithe figure who moved unnoticeably into the ranks of the Eldar host before vanishing entirely from sight. First came Meliniel, Autark of Bealtan, followed by Vrain, the Vizarch, and Eldred. Swathed in ethereal energies, the Eldar seemed like ancient monarchs stepping from the world of myth. As they approached, Greyfax's hand went to the hilt of her power sword. The Vizarch mirrored the gesture, grasping Asu Var in a graceful motion. These small acts of aggression rippled outward to the warriors of each side. 
escalating as they did so, until it seemed as if conflict were inevitable. Were it not for the strident words of Autarch Millennial ringing out over the cries of alarm, perhaps the Imperium would have lost its best chance to ride out the coming tempest, and perhaps the Eldar would have faded into obscurity forever. With Millennial's entreaty delivered, he had bought a few valuable moments, and in those seconds, chose to bound low before the living saint. His mastery of the human custom and of the Gothic tongue was impeccable. As Celestine moved forward to talk to him, she purposely cleaned her silvered blade of blood and sheathed it behind her, motioning her Gemini superior to hang back with the Archmagos call and his conveyor as she did so. The few remaining Astra Militarum still alive averted their aim, but did not stand at ease. As Inquisitor Greyfax stepped forward to join the negotiations, the Black Templar stood on the knife edge of action and inaction, casting baleful glances to one another, as if daring their battle brothers to make the first move. A brief binaic blurt of the lingua technis from Archmagos' call, and the Skitari marksmen aiming their long-barreled rifles from the mouth of the valley took aim at the Autark striding confidently towards the living saint. Autark Millennial was the first to act. The seers were known to the humans as manipulators and liars, and the Drukari as evil incarnate. A warrior, however, they might just listen to. I know you feel hatred for our kind, the Baltani commander said to the human leaders. You have good reason for it. But just as your million far-flung worlds each has its own culture, we too are a fractured people. You look upon that element that would see humanity and Eldar both escape their doom. We look upon pampered peacocks and depraved fiends, spat Inquisitor Greyfax. St. Celestine cast her a reprimanding glance, but the statement hung in the air, unretracted. Millennial cast his gaze at the strange acolytes of Aeneads beside him before turning to regard Greyfax. I thought so too, at first. My people have reason to fear the unknown more than most, but these visionaries are agents of destiny and hope. Your saint and I share the same goals, said Ivraine. Her voice was quiet, but steady and sure, even if she is yet to fully understand exactly what they are. We would see your pilgrimage to completion, agreed Millennia. You Eldar twist fate, said Greyfax, and only ever in your own selfish interests. None of the Imperials took their eyes from the Eldar. I know the signs well enough, said Celestine. The warp rift is an ugly and infected wound. We must prevent it growing any more. Enough of your riddles and platitudes, said Greyfax, her upper lip curled. Why are you here, Xenos? Because your wish to deny the end of all things outweighs your unreasoning hatred, said Millennial. This is a crux point of fate. We believe that here, by casting a stone amongst the snows, we can start an avalanche that will quench the flames of chaos. The dark gods rise, said Ivraine somberly. We must rise higher, the better to cast them down. This lump and thing, at this, she gestured as the Trios conveyor. This contains hope. The lord it belongs to will be a powerful symbol for your people. He will oppose the ruinous powers and turn back the encroaching darkness. The Vizark stepped forward to stand at Evrain's shoulder. And he will not be alone in that fight. You have won yourself an hour, said Greyfax. Convince us or die. The first hour of the parley slid past, and then the second, and then the third. The atmosphere thick was a sense of history in the making. By the time the cold light of Castle Horn's sun disappeared behind the curling talons of the crone's claw, the Eldar and the humans had come as close to an understanding as their race had ever attained. After the Eldar had said their peace, the Imperial leaders had consulted amongst themselves. The saint stressed that her visions had led her here, and that the Xenos rescue could not have been happenstance. It was then Celestine chose to name where they must go next, 
a pace that stuck a chord with every soul present. It was imperative, she said, that the cargo the tech priest carried reach its destination. Such was her conviction that she did not need to see Call nodding in confirmation to know the truth of her words. Given that the only route ahead was through a semi-mythical domain that the Eldar alone knew how to navigate, Celestine argued, they had little choice but to join forces. If the Xenos had wished the Imperials dead, they had but to watch the Black Legion go about their red work, yet they had interceded in order to save the lives of human warriors. Greyfax counseled caution at all times, but agreed that their mutual task was more important than the immediate gratification of the kill. The Eldar could always be put down once their mission was complete. Though he still suspected trickery and vowed to remain vigilant at all times, even Marshal Amarach of the Black Templars eventually sheathed his weapons, giving the order for his battle brothers to do the same. It was agreed. The Imperials would accept the aid of the Elder, placing themselves in their total trust. In actuality, they had little option. For to stray into the endless maze of the webway unguided is amongst the worst of follies. The NI delegation had promised they would make good speed, outdistancing the Chaos Space Marines that pursued them and ensuring that Archmagos Dominus's precious ward remained intact. So the two crusades became one, crunching through fresh snow to reach the giant glittering orb of the fractal webway gate. Their procession was led by the swirling warp storms that blighted the heavens above, the splitting steam that threatened to disgorge the riotous unreality of the warp into the order of the material universe. The Eldar filed through first, rejoining their craft world kin on the far side with solemn nods. The Imperials ventured through last, every one of them shocked at the size of the war host beyond and looked upon a world of marvels. As incredible as that webway's lambent architecture was, it was a mere precursor to the glory that would follow, the vector by which the Allies would strike out for their true destination, the realm of Ultramar and McCrag. <laughs>